This is LBC from Global, leading Britain's conversation with James O'Brien. Three minutes after ten, we will begin with an apology. I'm told that the correct verb is huff. You huff. I think someone told me this before. You huff noz. Is it pronounced noz or nos? Noz? Nos? You huff it. You certainly don't chug it. I said chug because it's a vernacular for, you know, necking a pint. You chug a pint. You huff nitrous oxide, I'm told. Uh, and we may turn our attention to that story later in the programme. But the PMQs is back today. Let joy be unconfined. Unbelievable. Uh, what a hole it has left in our lives. Um, uh, but that will cover that. And then I've got Rory Stewart dropping by to talk about his new autobiography. And I've got the inimitable Mick Heron, author of, uh, well, uh, many, many superb novels, but perhaps most notably the, the Slough House series, of course, recently televised, starring Gary Oldman. He's got, he's got a brilliant new one out. He's dropping by to tell us a little about that and other things. So it's quite an interesting show. First time for everything, I hear you say. Um, and I, 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 I'll give you a heads up on what I might do at 11, because I'm going to need your help. I don't ring in about it yet, but I, I, I don't think I'm naive. I can't really play that anymore. I think it, uh, naivety becomes unforgivable once you reach a certain age. It's like youthful idealism. You can't really use youthful idealism as a defence as you uh, reach your 50s. I'm not sure you should really be doing it as you reach your 30s. But, you know, that kind of notion that, oh, you know, I just like to see the best in people. I think this is ignorance on my part, not naivety. So um, I, I, I look that one square in the eye. I'm not knowledgeable enough to know how necessary it is for people who are married to conservative politicians to receive lucrative contracts from the government. OK, um, I, I, I mean, I'm thinking of Michelle Moan and, and others during the whatchamacallit, during the COVID crisis, during the lockdowns. But I, the Daily Mirror today goes in very strong on the fact that one million pounds from the school's rebuilding fund went to an IT firm that Gillian Keegan's husband is a non-executive director of. And I don't think it's the first time either. I'm sure the same company got a ton of money last year. I think it even made the Daily Mail. But I don't know. I don't want to be Wolfie Smith, you know. I don't want to be one of those very, very lazy people that focuses upon this solely because it's Tories. Like if you were covering the Birmingham City Council crisis without giving equal weight to the fact that Thurrock spaffed hundreds of millions of pounds by um, uh, investing in, a, I think, in, a, in an alleged fraudster. So claiming that it's got something to do with party political loyalties. I, I think we need to be better than that on this programme, although there are some client journalists over at the Mail really earning their dinners with cabinet ministers and their corn today by trying to portray it as proof of, of uh, Labour's fiscal irresponsibility. Imagine trying to portray Labour as being fiscally irresponsible in broken Britain at the moment. It's quite a, quite a flex, but there'll always be client journalists at the Daily Mail and elsewhere ready to take up that challenge. I'm, I'm drawn to this story about Keegan's husband because I genuinely want you to tell me whether or not it is unremarkable, whether or not it is lazy to go, oh, look at them all, cronies and contracts. I don't know. And so we may do that at 11 or we may huff some nods metaphorically speaking. Um, we begin with this story. Do you remember? You must remember, because I, I said it a few times, and actually you told me as well, and I, I, people rang in and texted in to say, I'm worried we'll be next, James. After, after the refugee policies fail, the disabled and people on sickness benefit will be next. It's, it's really sort of government by numbers with this lot now. It's astonishing, really, that we've probably not got the prospect of a general election for well over a year, and yet the sense of circling the plug hole is already pretty profound. It, it, you said to me, and I completely agreed, and I said to you, and you completely agreed, that when they cast around for people to go after next, because that's what this conservative generation is. It just seeks to break things. That's all it seeks to do. It seeks to break unions. It seeks to uh, break morale. It seeks to break the spirit of, of public sector workers refusing to negotiate. It seeks to break strikes. They just want to break things, break things. Oh, we must come out of the European Convention on Human Rights. Why? I'm a human. I like rights. Yeah, lefty lawyers down with that sort of thing. If you're a human and you like rights, you should like the European Convention on Human Rights. The apple of Winston Churchill's eye. It's a beautiful piece of international legislation, but this lot cannot understand that. 
it's there and and it's it means that the rights apply to foreign people as well as to to break it kill it leave it abandon it brexit that's all they do attack things break things sabotage things they're arsonists that was close they're also something else that at least sounds at the outset of the word very like arsonists but i discovered yesterday that the producer doesn't think we can use that word on the show despite the fact that bbc use it and chris moyle says it every other sentence but nevertheless we are a delicate bunch on uh, on the mid-morning shift so they just break things they just attack you've got to hurt someone who are we going to hurt today suella braverman kids in parks and the um work and pension secretary mel stride so i always think he sounds like a lounge singer don't you Sounds like he should be playing Vegas. Mel Stride. Tonight, live from Vegas, it's Mel Stride. He does not sound like a Tory politician. He does not sound like a work and pension secretary. If you're my age, you hear the words work and pension secretary, you probably think of Ian Duncan Smith for some reason, because I think there was more coverage of his tenure as work and pension secretary than any other, so that some names are associated. Say, Charles for the Exchequer, I sometimes think of Dennis Healy. I've no idea why, but I, I think of Je- Dennis Healy before I think of Jeremy Hunt. It's very odd. Think of, I think you say, say it again, say it out loud, go on, say it. Dennis Healy, not even Gordon Bates. Weird that, right? Just things in your head. So you say work and pension secretary, I think Ian Duncan Smith for some reason. You say Mel Stride, I think Vegas. I think Las Vegas, I think Caesar's Palace. I think he's coming on stage singing and now uh, the time has come. Mel Stride, ladies and gentlemen. Anyway, he's the Work and Pension Secretary. He's not a lounge, well, as far as I know, he's not a lounge singer, although everybody needs a hobby. And he has today announced, or is today announcing, that up to a million sickness and disability benefit claimants are to be ordered to seek work. What I hate about this sort of story is the celebratory tone of the reporting in the kind of places that are today obeying the government's orders with their coverage of the Birmingham City Council debacle. What I hate about it is the celebratory tone. Because what you are supposed to do if you read the Daily Mail and you're sitting there eating your toast this morning, you're supposed to sort of high-five each other over the marmalade. One million on sickness benefits will have to find a job. Yeah! Because everyone else is awful. Everyone who's not like me is gross. That, yeah, 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 let's take a day off from slagging off foreigners and slag off sick people instead, because they're all lazy, you know. They're all swinging the lead. They're all feckless, work-shy layabouts. They should all just get on their bike. In my day, you couldn't get off sick. In my day, this, woo, high-five over the breakfast marmalade, because they're going after people on sickness benefits. So I hate the celebratory tone. But... I don't want my own hatred of the celebratory tone and my deep disdain for the kind of people in this profession that join in with their full chests and accept with alacrity any invitation at all to attack the vulnerable, from refugees to single mothers to the unemployed who are uh, more vulnerable than the employed when it comes to the vicissitudes of the financial system and the state of the economy. And, of course, there are no people more vulnerable in many ways than the than the sick and the disabled. You see the language here. An estimated two and a half million incapacity claimants are deemed unable to work and languish on handouts. Why do they use the word languish? Why does Jason Groves, the political editor of the Daily Mail, use the word languish and not, for example, the word survive? Why do you think that is, if you are minded to high-five each other? over the marmalade this morning. Why does this man write languish on benefits? What does the word languish communicate to you? Just have a think of it. Languish. Oh, they're languishing. They're not surviving or struggling. An estimated 2.5 million incapacity claimants are deemed unable to work and struggle by on handouts. So I have a completely different feeling. Languish. They'll have to find a job. Why does it say ordered, not helped? Why do you think this language is deployed in this way by these people? Up to a million sickness and disability benefit claimants are to be ordered to seek work. Ordered. Not helped. Not encouraged. Ordered. Because they must be faking it, right? If they weren't faking it, you couldn't order them to seek work because they wouldn't be capable of doing the work that you're ordering them to seek. The fact that you're going to order them to seek work means that they're swinging the lead. They're having a laugh. They're taking the Michael. So we're going to order them to seek work and they're languishing on benefits. It's actually disgusting. It is fascistic. 
It's a word I always hesitate to use because obviously the end game of fascism is so well documented and so well known. But the end game of fascism, fascism? The end game of fascism begins with baby steps. It begins with people using the language of 1930s Germany. It doesn't, it, it doesn't involve introducing holocausts. It involves using words like swarms and invasion to talk about foreigners. We've got a government that does that before breakfast now, of course. We've got a Home Secretary who refuses to accept a plea from a Holocaust survivor to stop using the kind of language that was used about her family in the 1930s. Joan Salter, of course, at that constituency meeting in Fareham a couple of years ago when Suella Braverman looked her in the eye and told her, in terms to shut up and sit down, Holocaust survivor, I'll use whatever language I want to describe foreigners, however much it upsets you and reminds you of the language that was used to describe your family. So language is important. Language is, is the, the, the building blocks, if you like, of, of disgusting politics, disgusting policies. So I hate the language. I hate the people who deploy the language. I hate the politicians who sit there rubbing their hands with glue. I don't hate the people. I hate what they do. You can't hate a person. Well, you can, but you should try not to. I hate, I hate the language. I hate the politics. I hate the, 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 the environment in which it is embraced. I hate the idea of you high-fiving each other over your marmalade because they're finally going after the sick and disabled. And, and if I have pause and think, are you slightly, are you misrepresent? Are you just, no, I'm not, because why say ordered and why say languished? Ministers believe this total could be cut by hundreds of thousands if those excused work, excused work, <clears throat> excused work, they're not excused work. They are deemed unable to work in most cases. It's not excused work. You get excused work when the sales figures come in and you've all broken your records and the boss says take the rest of the day off. That's being excused work. I get excused work if there is a big royal event, for example, and they don't want me anywhere near the microphone. So they say, you can have the day off if you want. And I say, you're going to have to pay me. And they say, yeah, obviously, I've been excused work. I've not been excused work because I've got, you know, long COVID or ME or depression or, or crippling anxiety. I'm not being excused work. It's disgusting language. Mobility or anxiety problems. What, you mean like can't walk and can't leave the house? Yeah, that kind of thing. You need to be ordered to do, do stuff. It's not a mistake. It's not a mistake. It's very... Very deliberate. And guess what? Those deemed capable of work could have their benefits docked if they refuse to cooperate. What about if they can't? But you call it a refusal. Yeah, docked. It makes me sad, actually, some days. Some days it's just sad to see, isn't it? You make a list of all the people you think deserve protection or deserve looking after or deserve an arm around the shoulder from our society. Who would you actually put on it? Gillian Keegan's husband? That's what you've been told to do today. Grant Shapps taking a leaf out of the Keegan book and dedicating today's round of interviews to talking about himself and telling everyone that he's a lot better than some of his critics think. Secretary of State for Defence giving interviews about the Secretary of State for Defence and his as yet unidentified attributes and talents. Secretary of State for Education <sighs> telling journalists how unfair it is that she doesn't get gratitude while presiding over one of the biggest... Ah, uh, disasters in our schools since Gavin Williamson was Education Secretary. Gavin Williamson, of course, being sent on behavioural training after he held very senior positions in successive Conservative governments, including Secretary of State for Defence, a job now being done by Grant Shapps. It's like a Russian doll of ridiculousness. You take the head off one of them and there's another squealing self-pityingly or advertising their absolute inadequacy and unsuitability for big jobs. So what are they going to do next? They're going to go after the disabled. They're going to go after the sick. It's 18 minutes after 10, and I stand by every single syllable that I have just said. The coverage of this policy is disgusting. Mel Stride sounds like a lounge singer. And the intention of the coverage is to have people who have already been successfully groomed into hating refugees to now turn their attention to people on disability benefits or people on sickness benefits. That is the intention. But I don't know... I do not know if that is the intention of the policy. 
All right, that is the intention of the coverage. Now, as you will see when you read or hear anyone talking about Birmingham City Council this morning, the British media consists of about 80% Tory cheerleaders who almost take their orders over lunch from central office and pursue whatever direction the government wants them to pursue. That, in the course of the next year, will fall apart like a cheap suit. As the realisation lands that it's not going to be a Tory government, almost certainly, almost as important, then they will do what they all always do and just slightly recalibrate change their style slightly because they need access and they need access to power but just watch it happen you've seen it with brexit already find me a journalist that supported brexit and i'll find you a journalist that never talks about it funny that isn't it considering the responsibility we have to our listeners and our readers to actually give you the information that you need to make informed choices so you will see it happening you will see these attacks happening but it doesn't necessarily mean that that's what the policy is designed to do. So you need to tell me what it is like to be on sickness benefit, to want to work, and to currently not be able to. And you need to tell me what would help. 03456060973. Because here's the thing. Here's the thing I have never understood, I do not understand, and I doubt I ever will understand. Successive Tory administrations have made being out of work, whether through uh, circumstance, illness, or even choice, such an unattractive prospect that I don't understand how they can still subscribe to the rhetoric that millions of people choose to do it for fun, right? There was just about a case when I started in this job when you totted everything up for saying, it's cheaper for me, I, I'm better off not working than I am working. They have literally, if you, if you are a supporter of such policies and you don't think the safety net should actually provide safety to people, you think instead it should provide a short, sharp shot which sends them skyward towards the tightrope of life once again. If you're into that kind of attitude, then you should be at the front of the queue of people saying, hang on a minute, we've been cheering your cuts, we've been cheering your austerity, we've been cheering your um, bacon slicing off the top of payments to people, we've been cheering your universal credit, your abolition of housing benefit being paid directly. to. We've been cheering all of your ways of making it less attractive to be out of work. How can you still be telling us that people who are out of work are swinging the lead? I don't understand. 03456060973. Is it possible that this is actually a half-decent policy dressed up in the dis disgusting clothes of placating right-wing media? Or do you hear something very, very, very different when you learn that you are to be ordered to seek work? with an obvious and, I'm afraid, unavoidable subtext that part of the reason why you're not in work now is because you actually prefer it that way. It's 10.21. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 24 minutes after 10. Judy and Keith up first. But first, a couple of texts. Um, Chris points out one of my own favourite rhetorical devices. James, wasn't the argument about refugees that we were supposed to look after our own? Yeah, not the sick, though, mate. Not the sick. Um, and... Uh, Joanne points out, while admiring your compassion, James, pe that about people, people shouldn't be hated. Hateful adults promoting hate and otherism do need help, but so long as they are in government, their words and actions need to be called out as hateful. Don't worry, Joanne, I've got that. Keith, very delighted by, not that Keith, a different one, by the phrase Russian doll of ridiculousness. Well, I'm delighted to tell you, Keith, pops up a lot in the new book. Eh? Um, and uh, this much more seriously, James, please don't mention my name. Uh, if you do read out my message, my niece, God bless her, is suffering greatly with m multiple cancers. And um, there's a little trigger warning for you here. She tried to take her life following contact from the Work and Pensions Department. She sees these reports on social media and news feeds and is petrified that she's going to be rejected when the next review is due. Um, and then you share details of that attempt upon her own life uh, and conclude with the phrase, hoping she would never wake up again, leaving two beautiful daughters and a lovely young man who works part-time and looks after her the rest of the time. And those are the people whose reaction to the Daily Mail headline this morning, the front page this morning, one million on sickness benefits will have to find a job. The reaction will not involve high-fiving each other over the marmalade. Judy's in Tamworth. Judy, what do you think? Um, I've just thought I'd ring and say how I'm languishing with my secondary progressive multiple sclerosis. Yes. What a life, eh? Riley is the word that springs to mind, Judy. 
You know, it's, I mean, I lost a 20-year teaching career uh, when I developed MS, and um, we've been through so many assessments. We've been through the personal independence, the PIP one. Yes. We've been through ESA assessments. Um, we're made to try and jump through hoops, stand up, sit down, ask how many times you go to the toilet. What, oh. all, the, all the interviews we have are demeaning and, you, you know, make us feel inhuman. Well, th this is, I think, the crux of the issue, isn't it? Because there are clearly many, many people on sickness benefits who both perhaps could work with the right support and the right help and would like to work with the right support and the right help. But we've had 13 years of providing whatever the opposite of the right support and the right help is to these people, which is what I think casts today's policy announcement in such a suspicious light. That's right. I mean, I had a, a support worker for 10 years and five years ago, I lost her because the council wanted to start charging over £80 a week for her. Gosh. So she used to be my right hand. You know, she used to help me get dressed um, and, and just lead as independent a life as I could. But even then, that wouldn't mean I could work properly. No. I, I mean, c could you do something, do you think? You, you know I'm asking that question from a, from a, from a place of care. Um. I don't know. Some days I can do stuff around my house. Right. Other days I'm in so much pain that I, I can't get up. Um, it also affects my mental health. Of course it does. Um, so on the days where I'm really struggling, I mean, I can't walk, I'm in a wheelchair. Yeah. So um, I struggle to get around my house anyway. Yeah. And it is a struggle to leave the house of without support. And, and of course, um, you know, that means that you would be unable to commit to any sort of level of output, wouldn't, wouldn't it? <laughs> What happens? What, what happens with MS? You have good days and bad days, and th the thing that you end up doing is letting people down. Yeah, of course. So if you, if you signed up for something and said, "I will do such and such for two hours of, a day or whatever," there are days where you can't do that, so you're letting people down again and again. And the and the, I mean, the possible reality of actually finding roles that could accommodate conditions like yours would involve as, as you've alluded to not just with the support worker but would involve big state wouldn't it it would involve bureaucracy it would involve quite a lot of work going into matching you with a role that would not be compromised by your unpredictable physical condition that 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 is again the opposite of everything that this iteration of the Tory party has represented for the last 13 years the idea they're cutting the kind of jobs that might once have been able to, to find the, the gap in the jigsaw into yeah. which you would fit while claiming that you, you need to be ordered to fit in yeah. to, you, as a square peg, you need to be ordered to fit into that round hole. It's very That's sad. Right. I'm sorry that you have to put up with this sort of news. I think they forget that they may even have to put adaptations in people's houses to yes, do that work. Yes, exactly. Exactly. And it's hard, it's hard enough to get adaptations in an office or a workplace outside your home. <sighs> I'm trying to get an image of, of languishing, but unfortunately, Judy, I've, I, don't, I don't think we've ever met and all I've got in my mind, I don't know if I imagined it or not, but a, 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 a conservative politician in one of his dad's old suits with his eyes shut, shut, lying prostrate on the front bench in the House of Commons. I don't know where that's come from, but that looks no, to me like languishing. That would be a good verb to describe whatever he's doing there. I don't think I've ever languished comfortably anywhere, the amount of pain I'm in. No, of course. <laughs> well, I, I'm, I'm proud to be able to keep you company in the morning, Judy, and I, and I hope it's not too annoying for you. Um, no, L LBC's a lifeline for us. There you go. Thank you. I'll probably try to shut us down next. That's a joke. Don't tell Mel Stride. Um, and in fact, speaking of Mel Stride, a couple of people picking up on my suggestion that he sounds like a Las Vegas lounge singer. Uh, he doesn't, James. He sounds like a lounge singer. But I see him more in a working men's club in Warrington and Blackburn than Las Vegas. I, yes, I take that. And Rachel in Crystal Palace suggests more of an Australian fast bowler with an oversized moustache. Not mocking him. It's a cool name, Mel Stride. Just, uh, because it's a cool name, it doesn't fit Work and Pension Secretary. Thank you, Judy. Take care. Thomas Watts is here now with your headlines. James O'Brien on LBC. <laughs> James O'Brien on LBC. 10.33 is the time. I'm just seeing that, that my big fat Greek wedding three is out on Friday. I don't, I don't think I've seen the middle one. I don't, I don't know that I saw... The first one was brilliant. Absolutely superb film. Oh, I tell you what, speaking of um, volume threes of, of Hollywood movies, I saw The Equaliser 3 yesterday. It's very good. 
It's very, very, very good. It's very gory. It's very violent, but it's very good. That's such a great franchise. You know, I love the TV series with Queen Latifah, which is, of course, a reboot of the TV series with Edward Woodward Woodward Wood. And, and now Denzel has um, turned the Hollywood saga into, into his own. He's getting on a bit, and that's reflected in the film that he's getting on a bit. I saw it in the cinema in Leicester Square that is state-of-the-art. I'm not even going to tell you how much I paid for a ticket, because if you're listening in Birmingham, you'll probably have a coronary. It's unbelievably expensive to go into this cinema, but it's so luxurious. It's about three stories down. It's like in a, the basement under the basement under the basement in Leicester Square. And the sound in that room, it's, it's, it's a bit like being in a virtual reality headset, even though you're in a cinema. And the chairs, am I sounding really old? Is this normal now in cinemas? The chairs have got electric recliners. You press the button on the chair to get the... And it's got a little tray that pulls around in front of you, like on the plane to have your hot dog or, 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 or nachos or whatever your snack of choice may be. And, 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 and because of that, it, it cures you of FOMO. It gets you so involved and so caught up that you don't feel the need to check your phone and stuff like that. Remember when we were talking about reading on Monday and the fact that our attention spans have been zapped by both technology and oddly the experience of lockdown. These, these really state-of-the-art cinemas, I think, are the best place to start weaning yourself off. That kind of uh, short attention span syndrome. But I do accept that they are prohibitively expensive for many people, not least the people that we are talking about today. The million on sickness benefits who will be ordered to stop languishing. I don't know why the mail does this. I don't know why it's so successful. But to be so motivated by hatred of humans... And it never works, you know. However much you slag off foreigners or people on disability benefits or people who haven't got a job, however much you slag them off, the people who lead the charge, it never makes them any better, any happier. It never soothes their soul or brings them joy. They just think, well, just one more, one more attack and I will be a happy person. Suella Braverman thinks, right, we're out of the European Union. We need to abandon the European Convention on Human Rights. And then, then I will be a happy person. You'll never be a happy person until you learn the importance of self-care. But, of course, they spend their lives insisting that self-care is woke. 10.36 is the time. Sandy is in Redditch. Sandy, what's your response to this story? Um, I just don't think they're set up to handle people with disabilities and illness at all. No. The, the, the system's just not there. Um, with my own thing, I was just telling the lady who answered the phone, I used to be a job coach for DWP. Oh, gosh. Um, but I used to work on the work programme, so it was a subcontract. Well, it was a subcontract of a subcontract through Circo. Right. And um, I then used, I used to work specifically with ESA people. And then I went on to enterprise coaching on the new enterprise allowance. So yeah. coaching people into self-employment. And I was gradually getting iller and iller and iller. And I was finally diagnosed with fibromyalgia in 2018. Oh, um, So sort of become, it was almost overnight with it. And basically, we live. I don't know what other people. It's like my toddler's going to burst into the door in that's, a minute. That's all right. That's all right. No one can see. It's not like that bloke on the BBC with his. With, do you remember that one on the BBC when yeah, the little one crawled in yeah. in the background? Yeah. Is your husband come come bowling through in the moment in a moment on his hands yeah. and knees? Yeah. <laughs> Go on. So, um, Sorry, I've got my older child sitting outside the door of the bedroom, keeping guard. So God knows what's going to happen. Yes. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, so I work specifically getting the ill people into work. Oh, my day. And then I become disabled. Yeah. Um, and then she's banging on the door. Don't let her um, in. I don't mind. Seriously, if she makes a bit of noise in the background, no one's going to mind. Her language will get you banned. <laughs> well, sorry, it'll go viral, though, Sandy, so it swings yeah, and roundabouts. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so getting sick people into work was what I did. Right. And then... Um, Basically, with fibromyalgia, I don't know what other callers have said, but you live with constant, constant pain yes. and energy. And the first thing that happens is you grieve because your life has changed. It's gone. You are not ever going to be what you thought you were going to be. Yes. And so you have like this period of mourning, which for me has taken about five years. I'm, a, I'm about at the end of it now, so okay. I'm sort of clear with thinking. For, for the person However, that you thought you'd be, almost, isn't it? Yes, you're yes. never going to be that person. You're never going to do things. Okay. Anyway. I think I understand. Yeah, yeah, it's as much as you can do without having it. Yeah. It's, it's a tricky one to trick it head around. But um, I went self-employed as soon as I couldn't work for somebody else because you can't predict what's going to happen. So you can't say, yes, I can be in work at 9 o'clock on Tuesday. You can't, you can't say that's going to be a, a thing. Yeah. So I set up my own business because I knew what to do. I make knitwear for... Um, stage and tv oh, so wow. like reproducing um historical stuff so we do the knitwear for 
Christopher Wren's character in The Mousetrap on the West End, for cool. example. Yeah. And I've just done the one that Jim wears in Good Omens 2, different things, but I like, probably shouldn't be able to say this, but I, I make TV. Who plays TV. Jim? Who plays Jim in Good Omens 2? Um, John Hamm. That's right, yeah. Oh, hey, oh, oh, he wears oh. some lovely stuff, doesn't he? Doesn't he? Yes. His knitwear, his knitwear's on me. There anyway. Fantastic. <laughs> this is just identifying myself to the world now. It doesn't didn't matter. Before. Um, no one's listening. But anyway. No one's listening. That sort of thing does not make a ton of money because there's a lot of work creatively sure. that goes into it. Yes. But we were doing okay. And then COVID came and it shut down the arts. Right, Absolutely. Yes, of course. Shut. People stopped making and I things. Got, exactly. And I couldn't access any of the support because I hadn't been trading long enough and whatever. Anyway, we come to, I have to change, I have to move into my mum because I haven't got any money. I can't live in a house I was living in, we know. And I had just had a baby just doing COVID as well. So yeah. back living with my mum back in Redditch, but then yeah, old stomping grounds yeah. and things. And um, I had to change to universal credit. And as soon as you do that, you get the minimum income floor. And the minimum income floor is variable takeaway. If you're fit enough to work 30 hours, in my case, I decided 16 hours was probably most I could cope with. Right. Um, they take away the equivalent of minimum wage of 16 hours from your benefits. And you have to live off less than the minimum that they give you. So I have to basically make that much money before I can even start to make a profit. And I wasn't doing it because of COVID and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And I, I can teach. I can teach through Zoom. I'm happy to do workshops. I can do things. But I have to choose the time for them. And is, anybody, and is, is anybody helping you identify roles like that? Would, would that have oh, been no. your job back in the day? That would have been my job back in the day. And that and job doesn't really exist it. anymore, or does it? Well, this was the thing. When I, they said I wasn't viable, they could refer me to an enterprise coach. Yeah. And I said, great, do that. And they said, well, we haven't got one at the moment. It's yeah. a vacancy, so it would be a waste in this. And I said, but I'm a qualified enterprise coach. I live in your area. Can I apply for your job? Yeah. And they said... Well, no, because the demands of the job, you'd have to, the lift doesn't always work. You'd have to be in, it is a full-time job and it would be a commitment to other people. So we don't think it would go with your disability. You're basically said, a Franz Kafka story, aren't you? This is unbelievable. Oh, God, you're my whole life Franz Kafka story, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, yeah, I can't, I can't do the job I'm doing. I can't apply for the job I'm qualified for because the person telling me to apply for the job has told me I can't apply for the job that they've got that I'm qualified for that I could do if they were flexible. And it was a government department. Yes, and this so, is, and, the, and, the, and you are very much in the in the firing line of Mel Stride's policy today. You are someone he is describing, and yeah, because probably. you want to, you want to do more work. You could do exactly. more work in the right it's not context. Money, I still do work, yes, but I work course. within the bounds of limited capability for work and related. Oh, the LCWRA, I can't remember what it's called. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'm lucky enough to be able to be. I'm lucky enough to be so ill and so disabled that I can get PIP and I can get that full thing. I've gone through PIP reviews right. that have nearly killed me stress wise. Oh. I've gone through all their process. I've jumped their hurdles metaphorically. I'd have to roll underneath them in a wheelchair. But you know, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I'm sorry. So this is the uh, the idea that they've the right now. they've looked at this <laughs> cohort of people. They've looked at you and thought that's where we can. That's where we can save some cash. That's where we can. That's where we can crack the whip. It's actually inconceivable, yeah. isn't it? Because even though there are people who could be helped into roles, they're not yeah. really doing anything to provide that help. And their friends no. in the media are talking about languishing, and ordering, and um, stopping benefits. Exactly. Docking, or being docking languishing, and ordering. The person that can help the job. And, and a person well, that could help is being told, sorry, no, there's we no... We can't help you because there's nobody to help you. Help you stuff. Well, I hope the other stuff yeah. picks up. I hope the knitwear side of things picks up again soon. It's, it's, a, nice, it's a nice, happy life now. We don't, I, I don't earn a ton of money. I can't do an awful lot, but I'm lucky I've got... A, my partner cares for me and like, helps me get dressed in the morning. Yeah. Um, Good. Kids, kids just want, you know, kids who are homeschooled because I couldn't do a school run. Couldn't right. commit to a school run, oh, so they're homeschooled kids. So I've got two feral children. <laughs> I'm sure they're not Locked feral. Outside the bedroom door. They're not, yeah, well, oh, exactly. They they're not. If they were feral, they'd have found a way in, wouldn't they? There you go. So <laughs> <Not> true, <laughs> take your wins where you find them, Sandy, and, and take yeah. care of yourself as well. I hope we talk. I hope we talk again. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ten forty-three is the time. That's it, really. Real people with real problems need real help. That is not what this company, this country, rather, is about, or indeed this client media. Uh, you know, those three verbs on one page, one front page. Ordered, languish, and docked. 
Keith in Liverpool. Keith, what would you like to say? Hi, James. Um, I, think I just wanted to kind of give a, a, a little bit of a, an idea to people about the, the, the type of people who are being demonised by this system. That yeah. makes sense. Um, my daughter, she's she's in her well, she's nearly forty now. Um, she's got a little boy, and her partner passed away a few years ago. You know. She was diagnosed with a stage three stroke four cancer a couple mm-hmm. of weeks ago, and she's having chemotherapy, um, which is not pleasant to, to say the least. Mm-hmm. But she only actually gets full pay for two weeks in her contract. Yeah. Now, after that, she just drops down to kind of have to claim benefits. Um, now, she can't she can't possibly survive on that as much as family would help. Sure. Um, so what she's having to do is work from home once this is kind of, you know, once a two-week sickness has, has run out. Yes. Um, and I thought, well, you know, that, that policy is basically what they're... That's what they're... That's what they're inter- yeah, they're, they're, she's already... Re- she's forced to work from home by her circumstances. Yeah, yeah. And And how hard is that proving to be? Uh, well, at the moment... To, to or easy. Build, or how easy is that proving? I don't want to well, sound negative from the start. It, 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 it's not at the moment. So what they've done, she's had a word with an employer and they've given her a few more weeks sickness. Right. Um, on full pay, which is going to run out in a about two weeks. So I think all told, she's probably, although they, they said two, they'd let her have six. Out of, I suppose, kindness, really. Yes. You know? um, but once that changes, it will be very difficult because after each treatment of chemo, she's really unwell. Of course she is, um, and debilitated as well. She can't really do anything, I don't imagine, in those circumstances. And that's yeah, the only massive, income, is her massive. income in the home since her partner died. Yeah, yeah. How, how, has, she, has she done any research into... Into working from home, into get into, for when she's not recovering from chemo, is is there? I mean, well, is, is there any help in finding a role? Um, well, the, the, the kind of employer's going to let her work, yeah. so she 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 does like an admin job, so she can, can do, do some of it. She from can home. do do some yeah. of it from home with a laptop, which is great. So, yes, you know, I think I think <laughs> if I'm honest, we're we're grateful that they're letting her do it, but. It's going to be incredibly difficult. She's for going her. to feel when she's already feeling rotten. She's going to feel be, 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 like beholden, and, and and that's it, isn't it? It's almost like she's not allowed yeah, to yeah. be sick. She's not allowed the room to recover. She's got to. They're cracking the whip. They crack. That's why you use the word demonise. It's such an odd thing to do. Mm. It's April of this year. I don't know if you know Keith. Ninety charities and organisations were calling on the government to uh, recognise the fact that universal credit does not meet the most basic needs. It it doesn't leave people with enough money to live on. And yet this is the life of Riley that they're portraying your daughter as having chosen, uh, you know, uh, for fun and for, 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 I nearly swore them, for something and giggles, as the kids say, Keith. I mean, we looked at the income that she'd have and she literally wouldn't be able to pay the bills because, you know, you live within your means to to some degree, don't you? Yes, of course Um, you do. And, and you can't, and, you can't change the, the, you know, the, the house you're living in overnight. or the, And also, you shouldn't really have to. That's not what you pay taxes all your life for, so that your daughter would come up against it in these sort of circumstances. It's so bizarre. And, and, and that's, the, that's the thing. That's why I didn't pick you up at the outset when you used the word demonise. The media is demonising your daughter. The media is demonising um, every caller that we've had today. The media is literally demonising them by using the words ordered languish. This is Jason Groves, the political editor of the Daily Mail, working for Ted Verity, who works for Paul Dacre. Languish. Um, Never really any criticism of Jacob Rees-Mogg moonlighting on a weird TV station or having a kip on the front bench in the House of Commons, but people with multiple sclerosis, people on chemotherapy, people with fibromyalgia, they're languishing. They must be ordered to... Where where was all the... So the Daily Mail's attitude to Nadine Dorries, who has spent most of the last year on holiday, was to give her a newspaper column, to give her a lucrative newspaper column. Phew. Their attitude to people with fibromyalgia, multiple sclerosis, cancer, uh, long COVID, sundry other diseases we haven't touched on, mental health, their attitude to them is to portray them as languishing on handouts that should be docked if they don't obey orders to go back to work. Here's someone over here on the public payroll taking the mickey on a nuclear scale. 
Nadine Doris, what are you going to do about her? Jason Groves, Ted Verity, Paul Dacre. What are you going to do about her? We're going to give her a very lucrative newspaper column, of course, to, to write bilge every week. Oh, is she? And here's some people with really bad, debilitating illnesses who can't go to work. What are you going to do about them? We're going to portray them as work-shy, feckless layabouts on the front page of uh, a newspaper that is in massive decline but is still the best-selling in the country. Why is that, lads? Why does Nadine Dorries get a column as a reward for being feckless, lazy and useless, while people who are genuinely sick, genuinely debilitated and genuinely ill get portrayed as work-shy chances on the front page of your newspaper that might be read by their neighbours? Why would you do it? Why would you do it? James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. It is 10.53 and you are listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Um, I haven't dropped that new feature, uh, Unhinged Headline. Uh, I've just, I just forgot about it. So what day is it today? Wednesday. Guess what day I invented it? Monday. So I forgot about it on the day after we did it. But it's not a daily feature. We need something to replace Dory's watch. We kept watch, if you're just joining us, we kept watch on the gap between Nadine Dory's promising to resign with immediate effect and Nadine Dory's actually resigning. Bless her little cotton socks. It was months. Uh, but we need something to replace it. And, and we've even got a jingle. But I haven't, can't, haven't done anything today. So I need a little reminder. If you want, I don't, well, unhinged headline reminders. Uh, 10.53, back to the... It's not an unhinged headline, sadly. One million on sickness benefits will have to find a job. And while it is obviously the case that some people on sickness benefits could do paid work or more paid work if the right support and help was in place, I'm afraid the prospect of the current government being minded to pr provide that help and support after spending 13 years cutting it back to the bone is slim to say the least. Derek is in Manchester. Derek, what would you like to say? Thank you, James. Oh. It's, uh, basically, it's such that the wording it's frightening. It's the, la it's the language of the Daily Mail, not necessarily the language of the government, although they're usually hand in glove, of course. Yeah, I just it causes anxiety. It causes more stress. I personally have been on the on the sick since two thousand and seven. Right. Uh, um, I've had stage four lymphoma three times. Um, Sorry, you've been languishing with stage four lymphoma, have you? Yeah. Languishing. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, I've had major heart surgery, double bypass. More languishing. Uh, more languishing. Then. Uh, and then I got pneumonia languishing. after a stem cell transplant. Oh, languishing with uh, a stem cell transplant. You do a lot of languishing then, up there in Manchester, don't you? We do, a we lot do. Of and then I, I, I caught that lovely COVID. Which, oh, um, languishing, languishing with COVID. Which caused me another heart attack. Oh, so, my. Uh, I'm in a position now where I have to find work to afford to put a roof over my head. Right. So I'm very, I'm in a very lucky position where I've had a very good friend because I'm on fentanyl for the pain and stuff and God. Uh, and on a lot of medication for like my PTSD and all these other things and the heart medications and stuff. So I'm very lucky that I've got a very good friend who will give me twelve hours a week. Yeah. Uh, so I can afford to pay my rent. Now I, I struggle doing that twelve hours a week, and some weeks I can't do it. Right. And I have to ring him up and say sorry. I can't come in today, and I'm very lucky that he's so forgiving and lenient and uh, and so flexible with me that he allows me to. Well, he's to work. caring for you, and I mean the like yeah, the likelihood yeah. of an I... employer being that understanding who wasn't a good friend is is well, we don't need me to spell it out, do we? Yeah, yeah, I've, I've struggled. For, I've I've always wanted to work. Sure, I've always course. worked before my cancer. Yeah, uh, and, and not to be able to work it, it affects you mentally uh, to the point that. Sometimes, so I have to borrow money off my dad, off my son to pay my rent, oh, um, and, and it's, it's it upsets me. But sometimes I feel such a burden well, on people people I love because they're supporting me. When the government, they should be helping us. They should be the ones that are helping us back to work. I want to work, and I'm so lucky that I've got twelve hours a week. But if I do any more than that. It comes out of my UC, so then there's no point in me doing the hours. It just becomes this vicious circle. There's no real help. You know, I'm stuck in a trap now. So if I don't work, I can't pay my rent. Or I've got to ask my, my dad or my, my son, can I borrow some money this month to pay my rent? And then you feel this burden. You think, I think sometimes they're a bit better off without me. Because That's, that, we're not. Hey, hey, hey. 
Stop no, that no, now. Please don't take no, no. But that, that's where, what I'm saying. This is where it gets me to. I'm I, not. I understand I'm not, what I understand route. what you're saying. But you yeah. imagine you imagine explaining. You imagine someone having to explain to your lad what's so happening. We we, yeah, yeah, we're yeah, not going yeah, there. Uh, yeah. No. No. And I, 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 the book. That's what I'm saying. Where sometimes you you get to a dark place. You and can't see light. I mean, you, a walk. You, you, yeah, oh, yeah, you can't. Yeah. And then when they when they put these scare tactics out in the wording, you start to panic. And then you have to jump through hoops and stuff. It causes you more anxiety and stuff. And I just, I just, it scares me that it can just put it out there like that. Yeah. Uh, well, listen, the only words of comfort <clears throat> I've got for you, I've got two. One is that I don't think they're going to be around for much longer. The second, of course, is that it, 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 it's, it's a slim possibility. And I feel silly saying this, Derek, but may, maybe they are planning on helping people like you get, get 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 work whether or not it would apply to you with the 12 hours you've already got or not i don't know but maybe they are doing it in good faith maybe mel stride isn't as bad as the rest of them but um but they're not exactly very hope. well you can only hope they're not exactly very very comforting things Did, and and up until 2000 and um, seven, you were paying all your taxes, all your national insurance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was, I was, I was doing fifty odd. I, I had two jobs. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I was, I was working in the, the nine to five on a Monday to Friday, and I was working in the bar at the weekend at the nights. And why do you think they do? Why do you think Jason Groves, the political editor of the Daily Mail, Ted Verity, the editor of the Daily Mail, and Paul Dacre, the editor in chief of the Daily Mail, why do you think they want to portray people like you as as, as skivers and, and liars and chances? Because it's it's caused it's cause and divide. It's the the whole, you know, there is people that are screwing the system. Of course. And we we know they are, but the majority of people that are on the sick genuinely want to get back to work. So they, I think they try and create this perception of what we all are mm. that we're bums that we're playing on playstations at home smoking weed or drinking or flat screen TVs, mate. Water. Flat screen TVs. Flat screen TVs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was ten you know, years ago. <laughs> and that just works. And it lets the government off the hook from actually doing any substantive policy making or spending the sort of money that would need to be spent in the short term to create the benefits in the long term of getting people exactly. back into the workforce. It's, it's, we're back to the old short termism of it as well. If, 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 you, if you put up, uh, the amount of money that they're throwing into the benefit system, if they were to do something constructive, a lot of those people would be able to go back to work and they wouldn't be spending that money. It's just a. Hey. It's quite simple. I get it. There well, can, I, can I finish on one thing for you as Absolutely well, Absolutely you can. Absolutely. Because, because it has been such a pleasure listening to you for so long. Oh. And you do, you, do, you do make my day, so thank you. Oh, well, you've made mine now, mate. Seriously. <laughs> thank you, Derek. Look after yourself, all right? And we'll talk again, I hope. Thank oh, you. Cheers, yeah, Derek. Uh, it's 11 o'clock. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. It is four minutes after 11. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. PMQ's on the way, of course, at 12. Um, and a couple of uh, rather juicy guests coming into the studio after that. Uh, Rory Stewart and Mick Heron. So make sure you don't miss either of those. I, um, I'm going to go in the direction I suggested I might go at 11. Uh, we, may, we might do the nitrous oxide conversation another day. So Ella Braverman essentially deciding that kids in parks having fun will be the new um, small boats. They'll be the next one. I wonder if she'll try and deport your kids to Rwanda if they are... Um, what's the word again? Is it... It's not hoffing. What is it? Is it hoff, huffing? Huffing. Huffing noz. Huffing noz down the park. Uh, but there are some health concerns as well, and, and they popped up last time we did this on the programme. It's funny, Chris Philp spoke about the health concerns. I think he's a prisons minister, is he? In the context of uh, this mooted ban on, on NOS, on possession of NOS, nitrous oxide, laughing gas. And Suella Braverman talked about the antisocial behaviour of children. It's interesting that, not for a minute suggesting Chris Phillips sort of decent, but I, everything's relative, everything's comparative. Um, it's, a, it's a funny one, this, because I don't know enough about it. I don't know enough about it. Gillian Keegan is the Education Secretary who has embarrassed herself this week, although seems from this distance to lack the self-awareness to appreciate how embarrassing her behaviour has been. That's almost a prerequisite for inclusion in the uh, Conservative Cabinet these days, isn't it? It's, it's certainly not confined to her. But she is the Education Secretary who has embarrassed herself this week by essentially 
presiding over a really chaotic scenario and then complaining that she wasn't getting enough gratitude or respect or admiration for her work in presiding over a really chaotic scenario. It's reported today that an IT firm linked to her husband received a £1 million deal from the fund for rebuilding unsafe schools. So he, Michael Keegan, is a non-executive director of a company called Centerprise, which was awarded the contract in May to provide servers for the programme. Now, the Daily Mirror stresses there is no suggestion of wrongdoing by him or his wife. Um, and, and I get that, and it's important to stress that. Uh, that is a legal requirement, that, that stress is. But I'm interested in the morality of politics. We're always interested in the morality of politics. It pops up a lot on the programme, doesn't it? Just the expectation of decency. That's why... I talked about naivety at 10 o'clock this morning. That, that It is a little bit naive, but I think if you give up on that naivety or on that hope, then you're giving up on hope. If you give up on naivety, you give up on hope. I want politicians to be more like Gordon Brown than Dominic Raab, right? Or more like Michael Heseltine than um, Grant Shapps. I, 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 just, I just do, and I believe that it's possible. Nobody is perfect. Everybody is fallible. We live in a fallible universe, and we are frail in many ways, and the frailest people are often the ones most determined to tell you that they're not frail at all, but they're as tough as old boots. But I don't think it is naive to expect a higher calibre of politician in terms of credibility, morality, and intelligence than a... Than a than a party that has given us Boris Johnson, Jacob Rees-Mogg, Grant Shapps, Dominic Raab, Suella Braverman, Priti Patel, Nadine Dorries, Gavin Williamson. God, this is quite a good party game, actually. I, I try to take bets on how long I can carry on for. But this, this utter shower of shockingly poor politicians is, is not normal. It's not naive to want better. And Labour, of course, up until 2019, had its fair share of absolute casualties in shadow cabinet positions and indeed at the very top of the party. But they didn't have their hands on the levers of power. That's the crucial difference. So it's not naive to expect better. And I think expecting better extends to stories like this. And it's not the first story, of course. This is a story about a £1 million IT contract linked to the school's rebuilding programme. Now, if, for example, you are a season ticket holder in Idiot's Corner, I can predict exactly what you're doing now. You're either going, why isn't he talking about Labour-led Birmingham City Council, which we covered yesterday in some depth, or you're shouting, oh, it's in the Daily Mirror, you can't believe that. So for the benefits of mutton-headed chopmeisters like you... Um, here's the Daily Mail's coverage of the story. Gillian Keegan's husband is a director of a company that won a £1 million IT contract linked to the school's rebuilding programme, it was reported last night. So the story is also considered newsworthy by the diabolical uh, Daily Mail. Um, BBC, of course, reported uh, at the end of last year that the company... Uh, run by, uh, or rather recommended by Tory peer Baroness Moan, and uh, it subsequently emerged linked to her husband, uh, was being sued by the government because it supplied personal pr pr protective equipment that was not up to sniff. It won those contracts through the so-called VIP lane. Now, I might leave COVID out of this. Uh, I, I, I don't know. It's, it, it's actually up to you. It's actually up to you. I don't know whether it's wrong to leave COVID out of it. Do you remember some of the calls we took? I think the one that probably resonated with me most was from a young woman who worked as a sales rep for a ventilator company. Uh, actual ventilators sitting in a warehouse, waiting to be shipped. And she was trying to get hold of someone at the government that she could talk to about providing these ventilators to the NHS. And she couldn't get arrested. Michelle Moan can send a snotty email to Michael Gove and suddenly a company linked to her husband is clearing a £122 million PPE contract despite the fact that a lot of it is allegedly or was allegedly not fit for purpose. But I am... I don't know. I mean, this is up to you. So there's 52% there's of me that's thinking COVID was such a unique set of circumstances. I can see why they set up a VIP lane. Right, that's all I'll say. I can see why they did it. I can see why they set up a VIP lane during COVID. 
I'm 48% now. It wasn't a VIP lane. It was a sort of crony hotline. It was a fill your boots. It's, these are the people that... It's a great line from James Dolman, the Byline Times journalist this morning. About, there's a headline in the Telegraph, why I donated £5 million to the Tory party. And he's speculated that the answer is because I'll get £30 million back in contracts and probably a seat in the House of Lords. It's just sometimes mysterious. <clears throat> Rishi Sunak's got so much money. Why does anybody have to give money to the Tory party? He could cover it all himself. He gives £100,000 to his old school. Him and his wife give three million bucks to her old college. Why is anyone having to give two million pounds to the two? What do you get in return? Oh, no, just a really warm sense of doing our best for the country's most vulnerable people. It's like charity. Yeah, I give a lot to the Tory party because they're just working so hard on behalf of ordinary people. No, I give a lot of money to the Tory party because I'm expecting something in return. Ideally, a seat in the House of Lords. Guess who's got a seat in the House of Lords? Yeah, I think he already had one. The bloke who paid for Boris Johnson's redecoration. And he's by far, by far, 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 by far from being the least deserving possessor of a peerage from Boris Johnson's tenure as Prime Minister. Daniel Hannan is in the House of Lords. Daniel Hannan, one of the stupidest people ever to draw breath in the history of British politics. A man so utterly detached from reality that he even wrote a sort of fantasy piece about what the UK would look like in 2024. It's fair to say it is going to be about as close to what the UK actually looks like in 2024 as Kuala Lumpur is to Bermondsey. Um, who else got a seat in the House of Lords? What's the other one called? There's another Daniel. Probably even more of a weapon than Daniel Hannan. What was his name? Worked at City Hall with Boris Johnson. Still pops up on, on client media. Um, masquerading as some sort of uh, expert or sage or qualified to comment on things. I, I mean, he's they're hideous. He's Zach Goldsmith got a seat in the House of Lords as a reward for losing several elections and leading a racist mayoral campaign against Sadiq Khan. I, I, I mean, his own brother. His brother's the best of the bunch, but he should never have accepted a peerage from a man whose government he left because he knew what the man was like. That's his own brother. So there's kickback. There is... Uh, quid pro quo there is reward but here's the thing right there's another story actually from september of last year involving gillian keegan's husband or a company linked to gillian keegan's husband being um uh, uh, in receipt of lucrative government contracts here's what i don't know and and here's where i want some genuine help all right is it fair enough is it actually fair enough? Is, is it the case that once you get into this oeuvre, once you get into this world, then it's a relatively small pool of people that are swimming around in it? Okay, so the idea that a Secretary of State for Education is married to a man who's linked to a company that received £1 million from the Department of Education is is not actually shocking. It's not Moylan. God, you're better than I am at this. Everyone got said texting Moylan, Moylan, Moylan. A hundred people texting me the word. What you're right. The absolute apology for a politician who was elevated to the House of Lords by Boris Johnson is Daniel Moylan. They've all got a peerage. Imagine being so rubbish that you couldn't even get a pe oh sorry. We've talked about Nadine enough today. Um, I don't. I genuinely don't know. So you work in public procurement, right? You work in. Um, uh, the, the contract, not necessarily doshing out public. Yeah, you could be a civil servant who doshed out contracts to companies. You could be someone who works for a company. And I don't want you to libel anyone because it's me that will get sued. But you, you noticed a slight uptick in the kind of contracts you were securing after you gave the husband of a conservative politician a, a, a role as a non-executive director. Just say off the top of my head. I mean, is, is, is there any link whatsoever between the award of contracts and the conservative contacts, the political contacts. And that's why I said that the, what you met call it, the VIP lane might be different. Because, you know, when Matt Hancock seemed to give a contact to his local pub landlord, again, you kind of, there's a tiny little bit of me thinking, well, what if his pub landlord was really good at making this stuff and ha just happened to be his pub landlord, therefore had his number, and then you find out about all the money these people have made. And all the people that were ringing us saying, we'd like to do it for nothing. We'd like to... What I found most... Sorry, I've gone off on all sorts of tangents on this. I'll ask you a question in a minute, I promise. Carol Vorderman's brilliant on this. Just that idea that when the COVID kicked in, when we began to get our first inkling of how 
serious it was going to be, how absolutely horrible it was going to be, there are two types of people in positions to uh, contribute to the national interest, aren't there? So, so here are 100 people in a position to contribute to the national interest. And half of them go, what can I do? How can I help? I'm here. You don't need to pay me. I've got this. I've got... And then half of them go, how can I make some money out of human misery? And all of the ones who, who said to themselves, how can I make some money out of human misery, seem to be connected to the Conservative Party. They seem to be precisely the sort of people that ended up on that so-called VIP lane. How can, I make, how can I make some serious moolah out of this national, international catastrophe? How can I make some serious spondulics out of this uh, tragedy, out of, out of this uh, multiplicity of misery? How can I make, uh, I don't know, 200, 122 million pounds out of this? But I don't know, not for sure, whether or not it is unreasonable for me to be outraged and disgusted by this. The other story dates back to September 2022. Um, uh, the husband of a Tory minister works for a firm which was reportedly awarded £24 million of government contracts, it has been revealed. Gillian Keegan, a health minister at the time, is married to Michael, who works as a Cabinet Office civil servant responsible for the government's relationship with suppliers, but also holds a non-executive role on the board of Centreprise International. The company has received millions from the UK for government for designing IT systems for the Ministry of Defence. Now, The Sun picked this up. So... I, I, this is an odd question, right? And I don't want you to laugh at me. I'm not sure this is scandalous. I want you to tell me. I also want you to tell me, if, like me, you don't have any real knowledge or understanding of this world, whether you, like me, feel it should simply be a rule that if you are a politician, if you know, if you are in government, right, then your spouse can't work at a high level for companies seeking government contracts. Does that sound mad to you or not? I'd quite like you to agree with me on this because I don't want to be one of those people who, who fix, fits the facts to my own political feelings, you know? So for me... Thurrock Council going bust because they gambled hundreds of millions of pounds with an alleged fraudster is absolutely awful. Birmingham City Council going bust because they mismanaged horribly a terrible um, equal pay claim is absolutely awful. My attitude to those two stories doesn't change according to whoever's in charge. I don't want my attitude to this story to be defined by the fact that I find the current generation of Tories to be repellent. I, I want to know. How, 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 how outrageous is it for companies in receipt and in pursuit of government contracts to have husbands or wives of senior government ministers in key roles, all right? 0345 6060 973 is the number you need. A bit of an odd one, this, but I hope you'll come with me. And the question for the rest of us is, very simply, how unreasonable would it be for Keir Starmer, for example, to simply say, I'm terribly sorry... We wouldn't want your spouse to give up their role. That wouldn't be fair. But if you're taking a role in government that is linked to the sector in which your partner works, then we'll find a different role for you. You're not allowed to be married to someone in pursuit of government contracts if your role in government is in the same territory. All right? Hit the numbers now. You will get through, I promise. 0345 973 I guess I'm just asking whether I'm being naive, how this sort of thing works and how unreasonable it would be to say, look, if you're coming to government with your hand out, looking for money, looking for contracts, looking for lucrative business, then that's fine, but your wife is going to have to resign as a health minister or secretary of state of ed. You can't have both. You can't have one, one half of the family giving out the contracts and the other half of the family seeking them. Even if they're not doing it directly, it's just not right. OK? 20 after 11 is the time. 0345 6060 973 is the number you need. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. Three minutes after 11. I've done it again. I inflict an interminable introduction on you as I'm trying to work out what my own thoughts are on the subject. And then just as we head towards the junction, I realise what I should have said. Should we be angrier about this? 
Should we be angrier about the fact that Michelle Keegan's husband is a non-executive director of a company that is receiving money from Michelle Keegan's department to address the crisis that Michelle Keegan is presiding over? It kind of feels like we should, but I don't want to be naive. So 03456060973, I'm pretty close to saying, how angry are you? Which is always a staple uh, last resort of the phone-in host. Matthew's in Camberwell to kick things off. Matthew, what would you like to say? Hi there. Um, I, I, I've always been surprised by this um, government mm. family tie sort of thing. Um, I used to work in financial audit in the city of London, oh, yeah. right? So my job would be to go into a company and, you know, look at look at the books and try to figure out what financial state they were in and then report on it. I was, mm. I was a small cog in the machine. I was junior, right? Sure, yeah. But even then there were very, very strict rules about what kind of connections I could have. So I definitely couldn't own shares in that company myself. Um, my immediate family couldn't. My spouse couldn't. And the rules at the, at, at the job were, if any of that happens, either you dispose of them immediately, you disclose it, we do everything we can so there's no perception of impropriety, or you're going to risk getting fired. And that was as a relatively junior guy with very little influence. It was just, you know, one cog in the machine cannot right. be compromised. And the only thing it was really contributing to was an audit opinion on a company. We definitely weren't stewarding the country through a deadly virus outbreak. <laughs> so so I, I, I find it absolutely remarkable that conflicts of interest like that are, I think are tolerated. I, I think I do. And, and you're better qualified to comment on it than I am. I'm just trying to work out the rationale behind the restrictions that were placed on you. It was because you could be party to market sensitive information before it was made public. It wasn't, it wasn't so much that. It was because, so let's say I'm auditing, uh, you know, like a, an oil company, right? Mm. And, and w my, my work will contribute to a, a statement by the auditor that says these guys are, are okay. They're yeah. in black, right? Well, I, if my wife, let's say, has yeah. shares in that company, I'm incentivized to give them a favorable opinion because I want the share price to be high. Or you tell your wife that the announcement is about to come out and they're not kosher and she can sell all her shares. Well, I, I mean, I suppose that would be covered by it's not. I just trading, sorry, I, the, I need to pause you quickly. It's not Michelle Keegan. It's Gillian Keegan. Michelle Keegan's a brilliant actress. I just misnamed her slightly. It's terrible. It's well, not quite as bad as when I get Amber Rudd and Amber Heard mixed up, but it's it's certainly on the same page. So my apologies for that. Sorry, I'm putting words in your mouth. Is it insider trading's already an offence? This is a different level. This is a different conflict of interest measure. And and uh, I, 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 just to say, I don't want anything to do with either of those Ambers. But um, <laughs> yeah, the um, yeah. It was, it was insider trading is different. It was more just so that there was no appearance that I had been unduly influenced by a personal concern, yeah. like my wife owning shares and, and therefore me wanting to beneficially report on those guys. And that was that was down to the level of you, they, they would look at you funny if you even let the guy you were auditing but take him out for lunch. It had to be like zero conflict. So the fact that, that they do this stuff with, you know, husbands having million pound contracts and so on, I just I, I, I cannot believe it. I, I just don't well, understand. Let me it run, add up let, to me. No, I don't either, but the, the, uh, so the Department of Education said ministers had no involvement in the procurement process for these contracts, which were awarded in line with existing government commercial procedures. So this is where I hear a little voice in my head saying, oh, all right, then fair enough. No? Uh, I... <laughs> I, I, I think I think the fact that someone someone with influence over a department is married to someone who stands to benefit from what happens in that department trumps whatever neat little statement I think, uh, that I they're, they're going right. to release. I think I, I mean that a director of a company that won a one million pound IT contract linked to the school's rebuilding program is married to the secretary of state for education. I, I, it, what are we talking about? The perception of possible. It just seems to me that. You, you should err upon the side of squeaky clean in these sort of scenarios. Well, the, the, the standard we had to operate to was yes. not only do you have to be above board, you have to be absolutely seen to be above board, and you can't do anything that could even be perceived as not being above board, because that way, you, you know, no one is relying on you having honour and integrity, because I know we used to do things that way, but mm. somehow that went out the window in the last couple of decades. Yes, didn't so it? You, need, you, you need there to be no possibility of it, so there needs to be no link there. So instead of saying, I didn't abuse my conflict of interest, you say, I do not have a conflict of interest. That's the standard that it should be operating uh, to. I, 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 like I said, I don't know why it doesn't. No, well, I think. Well, no, I don't know why it doesn't either. Actually, it might be interesting to hear from a civil servant as to whether or not this is simply a, a presumption of honour from, uh, I mean, a political class which, in the last thirteen years, has probably been the most dishonourable in in British history. Uh, so I'm, yeah, I'm glad Matthew put it like that from the perspective of having been, by his own account, a small cog in the in the in the bigger financial wheels because I. 
I, I don't think it is necessarily naive just to say no. So, you know, here is someone undertaking an audit on a company. If you are married to someone who has shares in that company, you need you, you get you need you get taken off the job or they have to sell or they have to divest themselves of the shares. No one is saying that you are giving them inside information. No one is saying that you are tipping them a wink or that they're just saying that for the avoidance of any possible perception of corruption is the word that I would use, you cannot simultaneously have a married couple holding these two twin positions. I, why, why is that? Why? Why is not I don't know. I mean, how angry should we be about this story? And how unreasonable does it sound to say, as Matthew has done, that it should just be a deal breaker? Either the politician says, sorry, I can't take that job because my husband's company will be bidding for contracts by tea time today, 03456060973, or you say, I, I'd love to be Secretary of State for Education, but could you just give me a month? Could my husband just work his notice as a non-executive director at one of the companies that will be bidding for contracts from the from the Department of Education. And you can turn around to me and say, well, he, he won't be involved in that process at all. But I, what does a non-executive director do? You know, if he was working as a, as, a, as, a, as a foreman on a building site, then I could see why there would be a case for saying that's got absolutely nothing to do with it. But if you're board level or board adjacent, then it seems to me this is actually awful, I think. I think it's awful. And I don't really understand why I'm holding back from articulating the awfulness. I don't think I can ask you to try to work out why. I'm almost reluctant to be as disgusted by this as part of me now feels I should be. That would be taking the phone in model to a meta level that even I balk at. Uh, the number you need is 0345 6060973. -60 Thomas Watts is here now with the headlines. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. Oof, it's 11.33 already. What do they do in other countries? I, I, I've got a message from Sweden saying that there are really strict rules about stuff like this. So here's the deal, right? Board, board level or board adjacent, non-executive directors are kind of outside advisors on matters. I, I, I'm not completely ignorant about these um, issues, but I'm certainly not as well informed as you, you might be. Here's the deal. You've got a senior government minister heading a department that's doshing out very lucrative contracts to private sector companies. You've got the husband of said minister in a very senior role or advisory role at that company. How hard is it, how mad is it to suggest that that simply should not be allowed to happen? And if you really want to go deep, why, why am I personally, you've listened to the show for long enough to do a little bit of amateur psychological analysis, why am I reluctant to go in as hard on this as I am on, for example, the disgusting stuff about sick and disability benefit recipients earlier today. I don't quite get it. What's, what's, what's holding me back? 03456060973. Quick visit to Idiot's Corner. You heard all the coverage yesterday on the programme about the um, uh, Labour leadership of Birmingham City Council having an absolute nightmare. Alleged mismanagement, uh, 1.1 billion payouts on equal pay uh, court cases, another six, 740 million that they're in the hole for, claiming that it was only discovered by the implementation of an IT system that itself cost about five times more than it was budgeted. I don't know whether you counted how many times I said the word labour yesterday or today, but when I take the mickey out of people who pretend that this is emblematic of what a Labour government, or more emblematic of what a Labour government would be like than Thurrock Council um, spaffing hundreds of millions of pounds uh, on dodgy investments with an alleged fraudster is emblematic of what a conservative government would be like, then I'm, I'm simply providing you with knowledge, understanding facts. But our first entry for Idiot's Corner today is taken to say, it's hilarious that you don't even mention that the downfall of Birmingham is due to Labour. That would be the Labour leadership of Birmingham City Council that I've mentioned about. So d I, I do find Idiot's Corner fascinating because the idea that your brain has been slowly replaced over the course of the last 10 years by actual gammon is it's medically fascinating never mind politically the fact that you can be listening to a radio program where the polar opposite of what you're hearing is happening and be so confident of your own absolutely delusional position that you're going to contact the radio program to insist that the polar opposite of what has happened has happened I, I, I know this sounds a bit self-indulgent, but I find it enduringly mesmerising 
How, how on earth does it happen? How could be somebody be sitting there? I'm tempted to read out your phone number so people can call you and check you're all right. How can somebody be sitting there hearing me provide coverage of the Birmingham City Council story, pointing out not only that it has a Labour leadership, but also that people who take their instructions directly from Conservative central headquarters will be pretending that it is emblematic of something party political and completely ignoring the fact that, for example, Birmingham City Council has seen its budget cut, I think, by about a billion pounds over the last 13 years by central government. And then lo and behold, when they get a, a nightmare of a court ruling, they can't afford to meet their commitments. You're hearing me provide coverage of that Labour Council in Birmingham, but you're so sure I haven't mentioned Labour. What's the? How much trouble do I get into if I read out the phone number of people like this? What's the? What are the? Uh, what What are the rules? Is it? Is it a sackable one? I just think a they're obviously very lonely, and b they might need some serious medical attention, not least on their ears. Never mind the gammon transplant between them. But there it is. It's hilarious that you don't even mention that the downfall of Birmingham is due to Labour. And you're sitting there now thinking, oh my God, he's talking about me. You're not thinking, how could I be such an idiot? How, what's happened to me to turn my brains to boiled ham? He's, he's said Labour a million times, but I've sat here thinking he hasn't because I'm projecting my own bovine idiocy onto him. I'm thinking because I'm going to use this story as a, as, a, as a bogus attempt to pretend that the Tories aren't having an absolute nightmare at the moment. I'm going to accuse him of being as stupid as I am. But none of this is reaching you, is it? None of this is breaching that sort of fatty layer like you get on a pork pie just between the pastry and the meat. None of it's even getting through. But anyway, thanks for listening. Trevor's in Launceston. Back to the alleged scandal of Gillian, definitely not Michelle Keegan. Trevor, what would you like to say? Hello, James. Well, firstly, thank you for taking me on directly after Idiot's Corner. I appreciate that. Well, you're oh, only my... Idiot's Corner adjacent. Don't worry, mate. There's no <laughs> osmosis. There's no osmosis involved. <laughs> thank you very much. James, yeah, I don't understand why this country is not in sense right. and literally rising up and taking to the streets with... You know, we just see this day after day. I've got to, I want to be specific to the yeah. dishing out of contracts to companies where spouses are in senior positions, because we, otherwise we'll be here all day. Yeah, it should not be happening. Simple as that. No. The, if you could trust these politicians um, to do it, everything above board and have tender systems and everything else correctly, fine. But we cannot trust this government. We haven't been able to trust this, this government for 13 years. Yes. And it should just not be happening. And the people should be... You know, what, what is wrong with the British people that they are not... They're just taking it. I don't, right. I, well, this is, well, that's why, actually, you've just made me realise why that second yeah. part of my question isn't actually completely self-indulgent. My own psychological reluctance not to believe that this is as bad as I think it is or as, as it looks probably comes from a, a... Well, John in Exeter suggests it's a form of self-protection. We feel so nauseated by these stories and have done for so long that, that, that we, we almost lack the bandwidth to accommodate another one, so we almost talk ourselves out of believing that it's as bad as it actually is. But... Well, why? Is it that? Or, I mean, I've, I've, I've always greatly respected the British soldier. Going back through centuries, the British soldier would stand up, form a square, and march forward and be shot down. Yes. They didn't. They blindly followed. Well, their it wasn't necessary. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's a it's a it's it, I mean, it's a debatable attribute in the context, certainly, of the First World War and the lions led by donkeys notion. But I do take exactly. your point. Exactly. Yes. And is this what is this bred into the British psyche? that yes. this is what you've got to do. These people are the rulers. They will do what they want. They will take you your money when deference. they want it. It's deference. And, yeah, and yet the British people, it's, it must be something like that because we. Sh if you were in France, the French would be rioting over this. I, I, you know? uh, well, I may, I, maybe not over this, actually. I think there have been French stories about dodgy contracts and they, they tend to, I, mean, I don't want to make any national stereotypes, but they tend yeah. to riot about things that affect them rather more directly, like, like the price of fuel or, 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 or taxes or reductions in holidays. The idea of being outraged by governmental, what looks like potential corruption or room for corruption, whereas yep. the first caller essentially described his own working terms and conditions as, as being designed to rule out the possibility of corruption. It doesn't and seem... Unru people in the, yeah. 
Yeah, but these people in top offices should be abiding by exactly the same think, sort of I rules. Think it's, yeah, and, and you're right. Yeah. Maybe it's a form of deference. Two types of deference, Trevor, maybe, actually. You've got the historical deference that you describe, the kind of cap-doffing sycophancy. Or, no, sycophancy is unfair. The sort of cap-doffing, forelock-tugging deference that makes people think that Jacob Rees-Mogg has an IQ in double figures because of the way that he speaks or the school that he went to. But then you've got, and I think I might suffer from this, a sort of magic circle deference, an idea that, oh, well, if you're in that world, you must know things that I don't know. A non-executive director of a big... I just don't know enough about that. What I need to do, of course, is remind myself of people in my social circle who are very much immersed in this world and ask myself whether they are naturally brighter or or, or possessed of... And they're not, or more squeaky clean or more moral or more... They're just not. But I have... I think this is why Martin Lewis is so keen for financial matters to be taught in schools so that we don't feel a little bit bamboozled, perhaps, by the environment we're looking at and therefore feel perhaps I lack the qualifications to condemn this as roundly as I would condemn, for example, media demonisation of disabled people. That's my language. That's what I I speak media. I am media. So I've got no hesitation whatsoever calling out, let's do it again, Jason Groves, Ted Verity and Paul Dacre for their disgusting, despicable portrayals of people on sickness benefits. But I don't have that level of confidence perhaps when I turn to commercial matters. I doubt maybe. I don't know. Thank you, Trevor. From uh, Cornwall to Barcelona. Finn's there. Finn, what would you like to say? Good morning, James. Hello. How are you? I'm all right. Confused. What's um, going on? I'm good. I'm good. taking the sun at the moment. And what's happening in, in your government is crazy. Yeah? It's crazy for us here at the moment because we have, there's, there's a possibility in the future, maybe we're going to have a really right-wing fascist coalition. In Spain. But I'm Irish, so yes. as, you can, as you probably can tell. But <laughs> with... The papers here are, they're, they're laughing at you. They're laughing at what, me. At this moment. What have I no, done now? At, at the country. Oh, thank goodness. No, for at that. Great Britain in general. I was going to say, they could wait they're until I've got a book out, couldn't they, before they start giving me that sort of coverage? Well, well what, what elements? All of it? Are we just a basket case? No. Th- this morning, for example, because look, at the moment, they're trying to get over the Rubiales case about the, the trainer of the, the women's team. Yeah. But it was, it was a- amazing that they have this story today where it's the wife and the husband. One this is, decides this, this, the contract. It's being reported person, in Spain. It's being reported in Spain, this specific story. Yeah, it's being reported. In, James, of course, it's been reported everywhere. I'm going mad, man. It's going, mad. it's going worse every minute, this business, isn't it? No, no, no. But it's... What? You, I have a friend that works in Dublin. Yeah. And he, he works for... A company in the same building where Jacob Reese Mogg moved his company before Brexit. Yeah. Before Brexit. Yeah. So he was touting Brexit at the same time he was moving his company to We're Dublin. Just ma- 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 the... Making sure they had an office in Dublin so that they wouldn't be yeah, constrained the by the consequences by constrained by the consequences of the Brexit. He was telling everyone would improve their lives. Yeah. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. You're. The, you're, the, you're the, I'm sorry, but the, the English. The, the, you're the laughing stock of the world at the moment, eh? Oh, well, yeah, I mean, you're an Irish fella. You would say that. No, dude, I wouldn't. <laughs> I, have lots of, I, have lots of, I have lots of friends and family from England. I'm teasing you. But some of them are ashamed of it. Well, I'm ashamed of lots it as of well, but I'm patriotic as well. You are. It's a weird well, you place. Well, listen to your radio well, show, I, I know, I know, but I think there's a topic here. We'll talk about how can you, how, how do you process being patriotic and deeply ashamed at the same time? It's a really exhausting mental burden, Finn. Yeah, but it... it, it James, it comes within the family as well. That's the problem. I think, exactly I think a lot that. of it is. Exactly because that. it's your uncle, it's your nan, it's your granddad. I say what I like they about my it. mum, but you can't. Yeah, I'll, I'll flip in, I'll tan your hide if you say anything nasty about my sister. No, no, but you know what I mean. I, do. It was I know like exactly that. what it you mean. Just... I know exactly what you mean. Oh. Uh, man, this morning I just woke up, I put on your show on Global, and yeah. it was like, Christ almighty, another, it's another thing. 
That's got to make the advert. It was Richie Sunak giving three million dollars to three hundred thousand. No, wife. three million, three and million dollars, to, to, and and his wife, him and his wife, giving three million dollars to his college, a hundred thousand pounds to her college, a hundred thousand pounds to his old school. And the schools and a, are falling down. By and, the way. and a bottle and of cheap, a, a bottle down. of cheap wine. Back. It's sco- like COVID. I know, I know, I know. If that doesn't make the next advert, Finn, I will give you the money. Besides, but I put, I put it on. I put on. I thought to myself. Thank you, Finn. I, you know, that's really helpful to me to hear that kind of disbelief from outside. I, if I could remember it properly, I'd quote that Rabbi Burns poem at this point about go, 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 won't some gift the gifty gears. There it is. I've got it. Won't some gift. Oh, I've probably got it wrong. Won't some gift the gear, gifty gears to see us souls as others see us, which is wouldn't it be good if we could see ourselves as others see us? There you go. Straight from Finn. Oh, dear. 11.40. Oh, hang on. Oh, I've got the relevant bit, thanks to Andrew, of the ministerial code that may add to our sense that actually we should probably be uh, a little bit more exercised by this practice, not just this story, by this widespread practice than we currently are. It's 11.47. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 10 minutes to 12 is the time. The government has published a list of the 104 schools in England affected by reinforced autoclaved aerated concrete. Uh, This is the lightweight material risk at risk of dangerous collapse. Um, And each school has now been listed. I I mean, I I don't really... uh, Again, there's so much I don't understand. But the schools concerned have been contacted anyway, haven't they? And told their parents but anyway there is the list I, i'm just going through i'm not going to read out all 104 there's a couple i know actually ellen wilkinson high school in manchester i know would you believe me? i used to spend my summer holidays there in the manchester youth theater um uh, 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 and, and i mean if you want to have a look then i'm sure it'll be on the lbc website shortly if it isn't already i turn you back now to other news from the department of education and a, and a growing sense that we have oh wad some power the gifty gears not some gift oh wad some power Thank you for all the compliments on my Scottish accent, by the way, including Stuart, who thinks it was from Sunderland. Or would some power, the gifty gears. I think you'll probably find that Ravi Burns' accent was closer to what is now the northeastern English accent than what met... No, I'm not going to get away with that, am I? I'll try and do a Scottish one. Or would some power, the gifty gears, to see ourselves as others see us. That's good, no? Shall I try again? I'll try again. Oh, what's some power? The gifty gears. No? All right, I'll carry on with the show. Anna is in Halstead to take us back to the um, the curious case of Keegan and the contracts. Anna, what would you like to say? Hi, Steve. Thanks for uh, letting me call in. I'm sorry, I was just giggling a little there at your Scottish accent because it was wonderful effort, and I'm certainly no better, but my husband's Scottish, and I know he's probably listening to you. <laughs> Trying not to guilt too, but well Th- done, because it's certainly better than mine. <laughs> Th- thank you, John. Um, I was calling to contribute to the issue about the um, conflict of interest with the award of contracts. I've got so I've got I, I, I oh, can't sorry. wait to hear what you say, but why did, okay. you call, why did you call me Steve? I didn't call you Steve, James. Well, you said I, Steve. I'm so sorry, I that, don't know why that, I called you Steve. Right. I think it was a Scottish accent, because my husband's friend is Steve, who's Scottish. So that That'll be, that's exactly, because no it just sounded like him. That's what it was. It sounded <laughs> so it authentic. Was. You thought, crikey, I'm talking to Steve, Scottish Steve, you thought, Scottish exactly Steve. Exactly that. You see, see and the giving pro- you a huge compliment all by thank, all and, and the producer was shaking her head like it was... <laughs> <laughs> anyway, back, back to back to Gillian back to Keegan. The issue. Thank yeah. you. No problem. I just wanted to say that I thought the previous caller, the accountant, I think it was the auditor, yes. put it incredibly well with yourself that yes. he, he nailed it. I thought, you know, look, let's just have clarity. It's not about whether you would do it, and it's not like you inadvertently or yeah. intentionally were dishonourable. Let's just make it really clear, really simple. It does it doesn't exist. There is yeah. no conflict of interest. You can't do it. It's you just can't not, do it. it's and not even the possibility of it happening no, has been ruled exactly out. Exactly that. I thought yes. that was very clever. And I, I um, some time ago, was an um, auditor, an internal auditor for quality rather than um, financial, and okay. also a trustee of a charity. And they have similar rules everywhere, as I'm sure many other people will attest in their own industry. So to me, that was clear. And I thought he put it very well. And I think. I thought your question, your meta question for the call-in, yes. which was related, is very interesting because you were saying, well, why should I be outraged and yes. why am I not? Yes. And I think partly that might be because um, some people were saying it's deferential. I don't think that it is in your case, and I mean that as a compliment. No, I think I some not. people, you know, I don't think that's helpful. There's mm. place in that, absolutely, but it, it can get in the way of 
Mm. trying to understand the facts. So I don't think it's that. It could be fatigue, which I yeah. would understand, but I hope it's not, or self-preservation. But I actually think <laughs> this is going to sound a little bit, oh, what's the word in English? Sucky uppy? Yeah, of course it's not that, is it? No, that is works, that? but okay. everyone knows what that means. Oh, good, because if my husband's listening, he'll be howling with laughter because I keep getting these words wrong. That's a great word. Um, Every word was invented at some point, Anna. That's very true. Thank yeah, you. I'm liking welcome. this. Thank yeah, you. <laughs> but anyway, I think it's because... It's intelligent or sensible or certainly effective to go, hang on a minute, because yes. being outraged and indignant, it's, it's actually quite important initially. I think it's a galvanise. It's good. It gets you to be invested and look at things. But then I think it's really important to take a step back and go, OK, hang on a minute. Let's get that rage out now. What are we looking at? Mm. And look at the facts, because mm. there might well be something we're missing, A. B, you know... Everybody makes mistakes. And yes, there's a terrible thing that's going on in politics and elsewhere. It doesn't mean everybody is always being exactly. sick you're getting it wrong. Yes, you know, exactly. and I think I think they also might be working so hard to get it right. And I think we lose the argument if all we do is point the finger, criticize, jump to conclusions. And I know that that's easy to do and it's understandable and I do it too. But then we need to step back and say, actually, yeah, but well done here. And actually, that wasn't an issue. So maybe it's looking for that balance so as not to A, lose the argument or B, I, th- I think you're right. It's, it's actually you know? a, sort of, it's, it's a sort of self-censorship for the avoidance of laziness, it, almost. Yes, I think so. Well, I hope you're also, right. Yeah, not fall into the trap of, of football, saying, what we call footballification, where you're basing the pa- your passionate opinion entirely on the colour of the scarf around your yeah, neck, rather exactly. than on what's happening on the pitch on in front else. of you. Yes. Yeah, and that initial, I like that, I didn't know that term. What was it called? Football- footballification. There's a whole book about it called that How Not To Be Wrong by James O'Brien, Steve oh, O'Brien. Yes. By Steve O'Brien. Steve O'Brien, who's Scottish, <laughs> yes, like Scottish my husband. Is. Yes, that's and right. guess who gave whom that book for Christmas, James? Guess who gave that? I'm going to really suck you up now. Very, if that's well, all right, I'm going to be even more impressive either of you had read it. <laughs> well, I don't know how far he's got, but we certainly enjoyed looking at it, and he got and wrapped it and went, oh, thanks, honey, so that must have been. <laughs> well, that's it. What a lovely call. Thank you, Anna. It's, uh, Thank it's, you it's, so it's, much. It's a big smile on my face, and it just got even bigger because Lewis Goodall just strolled into the studio, who will be steering us through PMQs imminently. Um, We've got... Here we're making a habit of this, James. <laughs> yes, around three this time days every day. Right. I know. The good old hat trick. start to talk. Um, I, well, I suppose we can begin with the pre-match analysis, can't we? If you're comfortable. Uh, yeah. Are we, what, 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 what do you think? Well, I mean, there's so much. He's got to do the concrete. It's going to be scores. There's going to be. There's no. There's no doubt about it. And probably, and uh, Gillian Keegan herself, probably in the crosshairs as well. Uh, I suspect. Quite interesting. There's a lot of. Um, Pretty negative briefing out in the Conservative supporting press today, in the Telegraph in particular. There was yesterday as this well. So is more key. and more I pressure don't want, around. I don't her. want to gloss over this because they don't do that entirely unprompted. They, nope. they, they, they don't want to put other noses out of joint. So almost as if permission has been granted to go after Gillian Keegan in places where she might normally expect quite a soft landing. There's a lot of people, as we were talking about yesterday, both on the official side in Whitehall, but also on the political side, ministers and people uh, at the top of government who feel that she has handled this in a way which is almost guaranteed a terrible start to the new political year, that you could have done it in such a way as to be a little bit quieter, as to be a bit more collegiate with other departments and try and take some of the froth of it. Instead, they feel rightly or wrongly, that she has amplified the story in a way that has been very, very politically damaging to them. And as you say, James, you don't get briefing like that out of nowhere. And yeah. it is clear that there is a crosshair on her now. And, you know, there, there's a feeling, as, as there's a Telegraph piece in particular that talks about this, that she is, is rather gaff prone. Mm. Um, that she's, you know, she's a very characterful person in her own way. She's got a personality. She's not afraid to show it, as we've seen this week. But it does mean that you stand out from the crowd and we're seeing the effect of that. It is, yeah, I mean interesting that Sunak is, I mean, all that notwithstanding, he, he doesn't exactly move fast to make big decisions, does he? He's he sat around whining about Nadine Dory's not doing her job while still being ostensibly paid for it, but he didn't do anything about it. He didn't. He didn't. Well, and news could be about to get worse then. There's an expectation that uh, there could be another by-election coming as well very quickly with Chris Pinchot. Yes, of course. And that he has lost his appeal over his suspension and that he could resign rather than wait for uh, the inevitable uh, by, uh, by-election recall petition uh, which will come against him. So that will mean there will be another by-election in Tamworth, which again Labour will be eyeing uh, what, what because the it's numbers? a seat they used to have. It's yeah. a, it's used to be a Labour seat until Who was 2010. It? Who was the Labour MP prior oh, to Oh gosh, you're pushing me now. I can't remember. No, I finally found, found, finally I know, found a I know. chink in the armour oh, of good old political oh, knowledge. It's so. annoying. I'm going to have to uh, look that up. And what do we... I mean, all six on, on schools? All six on concrete? And, and, uh, and attendant issues? I suspect, yes, probably. And I think, look, Starmer is building up a narrative 
which is this idea of crumbling Britain. The idea that, sort of twin narrative, one, that nothing works, and two, mm. that the Tories don't get it. So you've seen the Labour Party pushing out social media video after social media video, which you have to say... They're rather good. They're very good. Yeah, They've and been actually, on I real... owe them an apology, because I took the mickey out of the shark one yesterday for oh, not yeah. being very good. I hadn't noticed that it was it had Mayor of Amity. Yeah, it was quite so funny. It was, it was a, the little it thing. It was the Jaws <laughs> joke, wasn't yeah, it? It, it was. wasn't just a shark's Yeah, 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 exactly. So, so but, sorry, Labour. Their, um, their social media game has been really upped, and it's been very notable, the extent to which, of course, you compare that, and it wasn't... A Conservative Party uh, image, as we know, mm. something with the Department for Education. But obviously, you compare yes, it course. to what started that in the first place, which was the stuff about most kids, could be, most schools going to be absolutely fine. So Starmer is building up a um, uh, sort of twin narrative of a nothing works and b these people don't care about you. And that is the that is why the Keegan mm. thing. Whatever you think about the rights and wrongs and our ITV putting it out and so on, that is why it was damaging because it gave the sense of sort of entitlement and the idea that she, you know, wanted praise for something. That clearly, you know, she doesn't really deserve any praise for. Um, I, I remind everybody that we will cross live to the House of Commons as soon as Keir Starmer gets to his feet. But Lewis Goodall, before joining the LBC team and, of course, um, launching the News Agents podcast, was on BBC's Newsnight programme and, and indeed at Sky News prior to that. So I'm interested to know what you think about ITV's decision to release that clip. I know you've shared these thoughts elsewhere already. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a difficult it one. It is, isn't it? It is a really difficult one. I mean, look... Um, I, there are loads of things that are said off camera sometimes. You know this, James, off camera when the mics go down or whatever that you probably, you know, you wouldn't necessarily think of doing. And I suppose, I suspect probably if I'd been in that position, I wouldn't have done it. I think there's always okay. a, but there's a probably, but then again, you know, she was still there. She had the microphone on and it was germane to the story. So I think the question always is, and it is always a finely balanced judgment. And this I'm sure will have gone up lots yes, of stages yes, in ITV of before. Not, not just like one no, for the cameraman, no, went, ah, stick it on no, Twitter. No, exactly. I think that <laughs> they would have, you know, there's always an, an editorial judgment about as to whether you've got two imperatives, right? One, which is, yeah, there is people can, an interviewee can expect a decree of sort of etiquette and decorum, coupled mm. with editorial, editorial interest and whether or not that has something the public really oh. ought to know what she is really thinking. And I think probably, I mean, look, in this case, and we've been talking about it, we talked about talked about it yesterday, in a way it was adverting to an important part of this story, yes. which is that Keegan basically thinks she's doing something about it and the yeah. rest of Whitehall isn't. That's the bit that made it news. So I think the that's criticism of her own colleagues. It wasn't really the swearing. No, was, or, was, or the demand for gratitude. No, it was the criticism of her own yeah, colleagues. Yeah, so I think probably, that probably just about got it over yeah, the line. I think but I these things are always just quite finely balanced. Have I ever told you my Brian Coleman story? No. So Brian Coleman, we're going to run out of time on this one and it's going to be a wonderful cliffhanger. So remind <laughs> me to return. He was the head of El FIPA. He was the head of the London Fire and Emergency Planning Authority. Right. After Johnson, after Johnson had campaigned on a manifesto promising not to cut fire stations or, or, or reduce fire engines, and I was shooting my mouth off back in the days when no one listened to this nonsense. So I was shooting my <laughs> mouth off about him and how awful it was, and, and my support for the fire station. He rang up, spitting nails, demanding to to come on the program, refusing to come on the phone, insisting that he would come into the studio live. So I said, "Yeah, wheel him in. Great, this will be interesting." Yeah. And 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 he started offering up the party line on um, what went on. Uh, you know, in, in 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 the meetings and how Johnson was committed to this and committed to that, and the, the, and and then then the light went off and we went to the junction as Keith insists on calling, it. and he he looked at me with a sort of weird, so, so, sort of I don't know, sort of contorted face, and he went, "Do you really think?" that Boris Johnson doesn't know exactly what is going on. Mm. And he'd sort of been saying that the mad isn't involved in these sort of mm. decisions and they're all operational. I said, do you... Do, do, oh, no, now we've got to cross oh, line no, to the, the House of Commons. <laughs> Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I join the Prime Minister in congratulating the Lionesses and his comments about Sergeant Saville? I think we all speak for the whole House when we speak on that subject. Mm. I'd also like to extend the warmest welcome to our new Labour member for Selby and Ainsty. Yeah. He's already made history for the Labour Party by overturning the largest Tory majority ever in a by-election. And I'd also welcome the honourable members for Uxbridge and South Ryslip, Somerton and Frome. Mr Speaker, the roof of Singlewell Primary School in Gravesend collapsed in May 2018. Thankfully it happened at the weekend and no children were injured. The concrete ceiling was deemed dangerous and liable to collapse, and everyone knew the problem existed in other schools. Yet the Prime Minister decided to halve the budget for school maintenance just a couple of years later, 
Does he agree with his Education Secretary that he should be thanked for doing a good job? <laughs> Mr Speaker, I know how concerned parents, children and teachers are, and I want to start by assuring them that the Government is doing everything it can to fix this quickly and minimise the disruption to children's education. We make no apology for acting decisively in the face of new information. And let me provide the House with an update on where we are. Of the 22,000 schools in England, the vast, vast majority won't be affected. In fact, in two-thirds of inspections of suspected schools, RAC is not actually present. And to tackle the 1% of schools that have been affected so far, the 1% we are assigning each of those schools a dedicated caseworker and providing extra funding to fix the problem. In the majority of cases, children will attend school as normal and the mitigations take typically just days or weeks to complete. We will do everything we can to help parents, support teachers and get children back to normal school life as quickly as possible. Well, Mr Speaker, Wood Green Academy in Sandwell was on Labour's building list in 2010. Yeah. Yeah. They scrapped it, yeah. and now children there are in a crumbling school. Exactly. Yeah. The head of the National Audit Office accuses him of taking a sticking plaster approach. Yeah. The NAO report says he cut £869 million. Pounds. The person who ran the Department for Education says he is personally responsible. Yeah. Yeah. Now, on Monday, he leapt to his own defence, saying it's utterly wrong to blame him. So why does literally everyone else say it's his fault? Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, the professional advice from the technical experts on RAG has, has evolved over time, and indeed. It is something that successive governments have dealt with, dating back to 1994, Mr Speaker. Now, as new advice has come forward, the government has rightly, decisively and swiftly acted in the face of that advice. But he, he talked about school budgets and talked about what I had done, but let me just walk him through the facts of actually what that spending review did, because he brought it up. Well, no, he's brought it up, so presumably he would like to hear the facts. Funding for school maintenance and rebuilding will average £2.6 billion a year over this Parliament as a result of that spending review, which represents a 20 per cent increase on the years before. Indeed, indeed, Mr Speaker, far from cutting budgets, as he alleges, the amount spent last year was the highest in a decade. That spending review, that spending review maintained, Mr Speaker, Mr Speaker, that spending review maintained the school rebuilding programme, delivering 500 schools over a decade, a pace completely consistent with what had happened previously. And, Mr Speaker, it is worth pointing out that during the parliamentary debates on that spending review, the Labour Party and him did not raise the issue of RAC one single time. So before he jumps on the next political bandwagon, he should get his facts straight. Mr Speaker, Carmel College in Darlington was on the Labour's building list in 2010. They scrapped it, and now children there are in a crumbling school. Yeah. And on the one hand, we have him saying it's nothing to do with him. Yeah. On the other side, we have the facts. And there's a simple way to clear this up. Why doesn't he commit to publish the requests yeah. from the Department of Education yeah. for the school rebuilding programme and what risks he was warned of before he turned them down? Yeah. Yeah. Mr Speaker, the Honourable Gentleman has now brought up twice the Labour, the Labour school rebuildings programme. He's now brought it up twice. So let's just look at that and look at the facts surrounding that. Because we do know the truth about that programme, Mr Speaker, because the NAO, as he's called on, actually reviewed that programme later on. What did they define? They found that Labour school rebuilding programme actually excluded 80% of schools. Next, what did they find? What did they find? That it was a third more expensive than it needed to be, needlessly wasting resources that have gone to schools. And Mr. Speaker, and Mr. Speaker, this is the worst bit. The worst bit is that that programme, because now he's talking about the physical condition of schools, that programme 
only allocated funds solely on the basis of ideology, with no regard whatsoever to the physical condition of schools. Mr. Speaker. That's why the Independent James Review described that programme as time-consuming and expensive, just like the Labour Party. We don't want to start off with somebody leaving so early, because that's what's going to happen. Keir Starmer. Well, Mr Speaker, they want more, so let me continue. Ferry Hall School in County Durham was on Labour's building list in 2010. They scrapped it, and now children there are in a crumbling school. The truth is, this crisis is the inevitable result of 13 years of cutting corners, botched jobs, sticking plaster politics. It is the sort of thing you expect from cowboy builders, saying that everyone else is wrong, everyone else is to blame, protesting they have done an effing good job, even as the ceiling falls in. The difference, Mr Speaker, is that in this case, the cowboys are running the country. Isn't he ashamed that after 13 years of Tory government, children are cowering under steel supports, stopping their classroom roof, falling in? No more. Just seriously, I will calm down. First session, I understand people are excited to be back at school. Will we expect better behaviour, Prime Minister? Well, Mr Speaker, this is exactly the kind of political opportunism that we've come exactly the kind of opportunism that we've come to expect from Captain Hindsight over here. Before before today, before today, he's never once raised this issue with me across this dispatch box. It wasn't even worthy of a single It's the same for this side as well. Can I just say we're going to have a calmer question times going forward. I want to hear the question, I want to hear the answers, just like your constituents. Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, before today he never once raised this issue with me in Parliament. It wasn't even worthy of a single mention in his so-called landmark speech on education this summer. And if we'd listened to him, our kids would have been off school and locked down for longer. It's as simple as that. He talks about 13 years. Well, let's see what happened. When we, in, when we came into office, two-thirds of schools were good and outstanding. Now it's 90 per cent, Mr Speaker. We introduced the pupil premium to get more funding to the most disadvantaged pupils, Mr Speaker. Today they are 75 per cent more likely to go to university. And as a result of our reforms, we now have the best readers in the Western world, Mr Speaker. What 13 years of education reform gets you, all of which opposed by the party opposite. Well, it claims to be a man of detail. There are 100 parliamentary questions from this side on this issue and an opposition day motion. But, Mr. Speaker, let us continue. Holy Family Catholic School in Bradford was on the Labour building list in 2010. They scrapped it, and now children there too are in a crumbling school. Um, Mr. Holden, I think I've heard enough. No, then, this is the last time you make your mind up. You either go now or you're quiet for the rest of this. And, Mr. Speaker, if you can believe it, in April this year, the Education Secretary signed a contract for refurbishment of her offices. It's got a personal stamp of approval on it. It cost, I can't quite believe this, £34 million. Can he explain to parents? whose children aren't at school this week, why he thinks a blank cheque for his Tory minister's office is better use of taxpayers' money than stopping schools collapsing. Yeah. Well, Mr Speaker, what I'd say to parents is, in the receipt of new information, we have acted decisively to ensure the safety of children and minimise disruption to education, as we have laid out and communicated extensively. That is the right thing to do. And I would also gently point out to him, Mr Speaker, whilst the Department for Education started this process 18 months ago in spring of last year, as far as I can tell, in Labour-run Wales, they still don't know which schools are affected. 
Mr Speaker. But again, he brought up this issue of funding, Mr Speaker. And again, let's look back to what happened in that spending review. Because in that spending review, I increased the Department for Education's capital budget by 25 per cent to a record £7 billion, pounds, Mr Speaker. It tripled the amount that we spend on children with special education needs and disabilities. It improved the condition of the overlooked FE estate, and it set the course for per-pupil funding to be the highest ever. But it also, Mr Speaker, crucially, invested £5 billion to help our pupils recover the lost learning from COVID. £5 billion, Mr Speaker, and he might remember that because he, we wanted pupils learning, he wanted longer lockdowns. I, don't, I think he just doesn't get how this it's all fine out there yeah. is so at odds with the lived experience of millions of working people across this country. And Mr Speaker, let's go on. This is a long list. At least, six, at least six schools in Essex were on Labour's building list in 2010. They scrapped them and now children there are in crumbling schools. What he won't admit is the reason he cut these budgets, ignored the warnings, is quite simple. Just like he thought his tax rises were for other families to pay, he thinks his school cuts are for other families to endure. Doesn't it tell you everything you need to know? That he's happy to spend billions of taxpayers' money sprucing up Tory offices, billions to ensure there's no VAT on Tory school fees, but he won't lift a finger when it comes to protecting other people's schools, other people's safety, other people's children. Mr Speaker, I, I know he comes here with these prepared scripts, but he hasn't listened to a single fact, a single fact of six questions about the record amounts of funding going into schools, about the incredible reforms to education impacting the most disadvantaged children in our society, a record that we are rightly proud of. And yes, of course, he can, of course we can name the schools. That's because we are reacting to information and publishing that information, Mr Speaker, so we know where the issues are, something that we're still waiting for by the Welsh Government in Wales. But, Mr Speaker, Mr. Speaker, of course he wants to try and score political points of something that we are dealing with in the right and responsible way. But I do note that he has not mentioned a single other thing that has happened since we last met across these dispatch boxes, Mr. Speaker. He talked about hard-working families across Britain, but what's happened? Energy bills down, Mr. Speaker. What's happened to inflation? Down, Mr. Speaker. What's happened to small boat crossings? Down, Mr. Speaker. And when it comes, Mr. Speaker, and when it comes to economic growth, what's happened? It's gone up, Mr. Speaker. He tried, he tried time and time again to talk down the British economy, but people weren't listening, thankfully. His entire economic narrative has been demolished, and the Conservatives are getting on delivering for Britain. There will be more. Nicola Richards. Inflation falling, energy bills coming down, growth up. People in the West Midlands are disappointed to see that Labour run Birmingham City Council has gone bankrupt. As a Samwell resident and a West Bromwich MP, I'm no stranger to Labour incompetence. Does the Prime Minister agree that Labour have demonstrated yet again that they always run out of other people's money? Mr Speaker, my honourable friend is exactly right. Uh, we started by hearing how Labour in London are charging hard-working people with ULEZ. Now we're hearing about how Labour in Birmingham are failing hard-working people, losing control of taxpayers' money and driving their finances into the ground. They've bankrupted Birmingham, Mr Speaker. We can't let them bankrupt Britain. Yeah. We come to the leader of the SNP, Stephen Flynn. Yeah. Mr Speaker, the public needs no reminding that today marks a year since the Prime Minister's predecessor yes. took office. Yes. And upon her speedy departure, they will have thought that things were going to get better. But when we look at unemployment figures, they're higher. When we look at food prices, they're higher. When we look at mortgage rates, they're higher. And economic growth is stagnant. So can I ask the Prime Minister, when is he going to get off his backside and do something about it. Yeah. Well, Mr. Mr. Speaker, I think what the Honourable Gentleman
fail to point out is that the amount of times I've sat across the dispatches from him and his colleagues and heard how somehow we were a laggard when it came to growth, Mr Speaker. What he didn't do is take the opportunity to correct the record today, now that the pub figures have been published, which demonstrate, in fact, we had the fastest recovery out of any European economy after Covid. Mr Speaker, you'd be forgiven for thinking that the Prime Minister thinks everything is all right. But let's look at his proposals for the winter when it comes to a cost of living package. Because when it comes to energy bills, his plan, of course, is to do nothing. When it comes to mortgage bills, his plan is to do nothing. And when it comes to food bills, his plan is to do nothing. So when the shadow so, well, sorry, when the Secretary of State for soon, Education soon, soon. said earlier this week that everyone was doing nothing. She was referring to the Prime Minister, wasn't she? Mr Speaker, I think it's a little bit out of practice, because when it comes to energy bills, what we have done is pay for around half of a typical family's energy bill over the past year. Support worth £1,500, Mr Speaker, benefiting families in Scotland. He asks about mortgages, Mr Speaker. The Chancellor's mortgage charter covers 90% of the mortgage market and ensures that a typical mortgage holder can save hundreds of pounds a month when it comes to their mortgage refinancing. And when he talked about energy, thanks to the actions of this Government, we are supporting the hundreds of thousands of jobs in the Scottish oil and gas industry, yeah. securing this country's energy yeah. supply, something that he opposes. Yeah. I will always do what's right for the people of Scotland, Mr Speaker, and it's time the SNP did the same. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I was delighted when the Prime Minister last year said that on his watch we would not lose swathes of farmland to solar applications, instead rightly arguing for solar to be installed. Uh, and we're back yeah, in the room. PMQ's there. We will pick over the bones. Uh, Lewis Gordall and I shortly. The time now is 20 minutes after 12. You are listening to James O'Brien, not Steve, on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. <laughs> James O'Brien on LBC. 23 minutes after 12. Rory Stewart and Mick Heron joining us after the half past 12 news. Not at the same time, necessarily. It's not the Graham Norton show. But uh, both discussing uh, new volumes that are uh, imminent or published already. Lewis Goodall joins us until then. As predicted, all six questions on the schools issue. Um, what did you make of that? Yeah, I mean, look, it is exactly as expected, right? That's going to be the rinse and repeat right up until the general election. Um, Starmer is going to repeat those narratives that I mentioned. I think the striking thing is, is that, and they've really, I mean, if, if Sunak is going to have even a remote chance and we're told that he thinks he's got one, and indeed several people have recently left Downing Street because they were not so convinced about mm. this, they've got to have a counter-narrative. Mm. They've got to have a better counter narrative than either talking about what happened under various Labour programmes that everybody has forgotten because yes. it was so long ago yes. and quite a big proportion of the electorate weren't even able to vote or were themselves in school when point. this stuff was going on. And they just need a sharper political rebuttal. Like what is Star what is Sunak's message? Not only about themselves which, you know, to some extent was always about steadying the ship, fixing things. Well, there's a big problem when things aren't fixed and when things are demonstrably, demonstrably getting worse. But also, what's the, what, is the, what is the conservative message about Labour? Mm. And what is their overarching message that they're going to try and frighten about Labour with the electorate? in the run-up to the next general election. I mean, there's obviously all the old tricks about, you know, no money left, they spend all the money. Birmingham, as we were talking about yesterday, that got a mention already. We'll hear mm -hmm. lots more about that. But it feels very often as if Sunak, and, and to some extent maybe this is just a reflection of their political position, which is just starting to increasingly run on fumes, which is they're just sort of scrambling around trying to pick up whatever weapon is around him. And many of these weapons are old and aged and don't really have much impact anymore. They did once... You know, stuff about, we'll hear about coalition of chaos, mm. no money left, all of this stuff. It's like the greatest hits of the last 13 years. But there's nothing new. And they've got to try and find and craft some kind of analysis of what is wrong with Labour and why you can't trust Sunak. And it's not really, uh, Starmer, and it's not really there at the moment. And, and equally absurd, perhaps, is, is the attempt to portray themselves as smashing it. Well, yeah. I mean, again, this is, and again, this, this reflects again the strategic problem, right? Which is, how do you... How do you uh, manage to craft a message which at once pays attention and heed uh, and credit, gives credit to the idea that things aren't great in so many different ways, and at the same time try and find an excuse for the fact that that has happened 
despite the fact you've been in office for 13 years. And in a way, Keegan, the whole Keegan stuff in this school's issue is a really good microcosm mm. for that, right? Because they end up in a position where they end up saying, no, most things are fine, really. Most things are fine. But they'd end up looking... The, the, the trick with politics is to do that in a really deft way. Yes. And I think, you know, as we've seen time and time again, one of Sunak's problems is, is that he's not a... Leaving Keegan to one side, he's not especially deft at crafting that message. And he just... So often seems, and I think this is again why the Keegan thing was quite damaging. He seems irritated. We've talked he about does, this before. He, he seems peeved. Yes, I've got the word petulant anyone... in my inbox three or four times in the he, last twenty he always minutes. Always has this slight tone. It's of... almost how dare you? Slightly. Yes. And and uh, and I'm sure. Look, I think all prime ministers feel like that. Yes, They're working all hours. God sends. They are you certainly know, trying... like Gillian Keegan. They've now. got well. They've got. <laughs> I know. They've got well. They've got a million missiles sort of heading yes. their way every single day. They're trying to bat them away. They're trying in their own heads. I think I'm working really hard. I'm doing my best. But of course. That doesn't cut the mustard at all in politics. And he's got to find a way of basically expressing himself better because in a heat of a general election as well, that is going to become exposed very, very quickly. Uh, I, although, as Jason points out, Starmer was actually lacklustre. It was the narrative that won it for him rather yeah. than the performance. Yeah, that's right. I mean, I don't think it was a particularly electrifying performance for anybody. But the point is, the sort of macro point is, is that at least Starmer has got a narrative, indeed mm. a couple of narratives, yes. and soon that doesn't. And Labour are already sort of furiously texting around political journalists, including myself, uh, saying that what Sunak said about uh, Starmer not mentioning school buildings in his education speech is in fact incorrect. So they're oh. sending around this transcript which says that Starmer said, so for his Tory party to turn around afterwards and repay their sacrifice with nothing, to sit there twiddling their thumbs as teachers leave in their droves, school buildings start to crumble and absenteeism goes, absenteeism goes through the roof. That's shameful. So, you know, there's another... It was an odd. It was an odd gambit, anyway. I think to say yes, there is a massive problem, and we are in charge. But you've never mentioned it before. Well, yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. The building's on fire, but I, I didn't hear you raising the alarm. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Again, there's no, there's no central message. There's no narrative that cuts through every interview. They've got to get it sorted out. Very funny. Shall I finish my story? Yeah, go on. Go so, on. so there's this the nation is a hideous, hideous politician. One, one of Johnson's sort of henchmen in the early days of his mayoralty, and and because the lights have gone off. He thinks that you know now. Now we'll have the real conversation. That, that you know uh, that we, we don't bother the public with this sort of stuff. So, again, do you really think that Boris Johnson doesn't know exactly what's going on? And I said, well, no, of course I, I, I believed what you told me during the interview. Oh, don't be ridiculous. He knows exactly about closing fire stations and closing. Mm. So I looked up at, at Jones, the engineer, who was in the playing the role of Keith at the time, and I said, we've got all this on tape, have we? We'll play it out after the news. And the bloke exploded. He ran out. He waddled out of the studio at 100 miles an hour. He marched into the production office and said, if you play this, it will be disgraceful. I will have your... And I'm just sitting here going, we'll definitely play it out. We'll definitely play it out. <laughs> there was never any recording. We don't, oh, the, tapes aren't, the tapes aren't running when we're off yeah, as soon as yeah, the light. Yeah. But it was an interesting insight into... Yeah. Perhaps a we say a sense of entitlement that some of these people pursue. Look, these people have got to remember. I mean, in a way, and this is the counter argument with Keegan. I mean, they've yes. got to remember that journalists are not their friends, right? Well, exactly. and and sometimes and sometimes well, you, you say that. Well, I mean. well, there are lots. <laughs> that, there are lots that are. That's true. But ideally, they're not friends. They're not and ultimately, any names. and ultimately, you know, this is an antagonistic thing, and you know, yes. you shouldn't be surprised. Just treat every microphone like a live microphone. Very wise, indeed. Yeah, sure you me. do, James. Well, I swear too much. Well, Keith, Keith has palpitations. I've got to stop swearing in the studio because one day the mic will... I don't ever say that anything... That is John in, Sopel, you. In this, oh, no, right, let's not get carried away. No, no. Um, thank you. My uh, pleasure. Good. Always a pleasure. And I've got Rory Stewart next and then, of course, Mick Heron um, after that. There is a question, I, I think this is correct, from one of my listeners that actually knit to the two guests together in a rather beautiful way. But first, Amelia Cox is here with your headlines. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 12.33 is the time. There was something bothering me about the list of schools that has been published and which has been running alongside footage of PMQ somewhat infelicitously for Rishi Sunak. And Lucy Easthope, uh, who you remember as the um, emergency response expert uh, that has appeared on the Full Disclosure podcast, just pointed out what the problem is. They've named the schools but not the locations. So you've got, you've got a big list of schools. It'll say St Paul's Primary School. How many St Paul's Primary Schools do you think there are in the country? I'd suggest more than one. But um, anyway, I don't know whether that's incompetence or some master plan that is currently eluding me. And that is occasionally a question that 
presents itself when we contemplate British politics. Is there some sinister master plan that is currently eluding us or are they all as awful as they appear to be? Into that breach steps Rory Stewart uh, with a new memoir. In fact, it's, it's a memoir from within. It is about his political career and it's called Politics on the Edge. I'll start with a slightly amateurish question, if I may. Where do you find the time to write a book with all your other responsibilities and podcasts and, and uh, adventures? So thank you. I left politics and I went to teach at Yale University University in the States and then I moved to Jordan with my family and we've been living living in Jordan for the last year and a half. I've been writing writing in the States and in Jordan. And, and you do the stuff with Alistair Campbell remotely? Do that remotely and then I've been working on it with a charity mostly in Africa. Yeah. Which speaks of a sense of duty that we've discussed before. Uh, the, the, the idea that there, there could have been some more lucrative baubles that you could have collected after your political career, or of course you could have started agitating and, and, um, and planning and plotting political returns. It, 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 that side of it never appealed to you. And, and I, I wonder whether part of the sense of surprise that, that, that runs through politics on the edge was a degree of naivety about what motivated other people to go into politics. I, I definitely think I, I went into politics naive. I, I didn't understand a lot of things. I didn't understand from the outside, just how important the party and the whips are. You hear about these kind of things. Of course, I knew about them in theory, but it's not until you're actually um, feeling really embarrassed and hiding in the toilet because you're trying to avoid a, a vote on VAT on Mountain Rescue that you really understand just how embarrassing the whole system is. How, how quickly did the scales fall from your eyes? I think it was almost my first PMQs. I remember a sense of <laughs> real horror. <laughs> Just well, you just heard that. I mean, thank goodness things have got so much better, Rory. Yes. Well, I just remember walking in thinking, goodness gracious, is this what we all look like? Is this what we all smell like? Is this, is this what the great beating heart of democracy is? And then everyone starts there, here, yeah, yeah, and all this kind of stuff. And I thought, wow. Because I, I still, I think, thought that it could be a place for serious conversation about policy. And probably that's the fundamental problem. Mm. It's not a place for serious conversation about policy. It's for point scoring and pretty rubbish amateur theatricals. And many of us think that has accelerated or, or, or even come into focus in relatively recent years. But, but your, your memoir dates back to your entry into Parliament in 2010. So this, is, this isn't a sort of Brexit malaise or a... I mean, this is baked in to the system. I, I think in a way, a lot of what contributed to Brexit and to populism around the world is the way that people like me and many, many others failed in the 90s and the 2000s to create a better form of politics and that actually we'd created a very complacent form of politics that wasn't addressing economic injustice in the north of England, wasn't really delivering proper democracy to people. And a lot of the rest followed from that. One of the reviewers suggests that you may have had a less bruising time had you been a Labour MP in 2010. So I don't think this is a stupid question. I mean, I don't imagine that you spent a lot of time contemplating other parties, but, but why did you want to join the Conservative Party in the form it was in at the time that you joined it? So the I, Parliamentary Party. Yeah, I joined David Cameron's yes. party, and uh, I actually believed in this thing which everybody makes jokes about called the big society. Oh, you did? And I thought it, it was... It was you, wasn't it? <laughs> I was the only person, exactly. I was the sole believer. Um, and I think it's because I'd seen in Iraq and Afghanistan the Labour government as being very centralising, trying to do very theoretical things to distant communities. And I felt that we needed to decentralise. And I really believe that David Cameron and a guy called Greg Clark that mm. I worked with closely were serious about getting power out of Westminster and down to local areas. The most exciting conversation I had yesterday was with Andy Burnham and Andy Street, the, the, the mayors of the West Midlands and Greater Manchester. I think that's where the energy is in British politics. And, and I really, my what question in my mind is not really, should I have joined the Labour Party? It's should I probably have gone into local politics where I think maybe things are a bit more immediate. You can see the effect of your efforts. Yeah, and, and it's place-based. I think there's something yeah. wonderful about not having to talk about 70 million people but focus on a place like Greater Manchester and try to address its needs.
I, I should mention Sebastian Fawkes is my guest on Full Disclosure this afternoon, actually. So um, uh, it, it's a bit of a coincidence that these planets are aligning uh, today. He has described, well, he says, at last a politician who can write. And, and there is, you know, a beautiful turn of phrase in the book, uh, um, uh, furtive cunning of Boris Johnson. But the, the proximity, it's almost as if it were planned in advance. The roles that you took post-2015 when David Cameron elevated you, I mean, it's sort of, I don't know what's one up from a ringside seat, but it was, I suppose it's being in the clown car with the chief clown. Now, first of all, with Liz Truss, of course. Yes, so I, I was with Liz Truss first, and that was an extraordinary experience because I think I saw there very closely what she would be as Prime Minister. Um, I remember going in to see her and she said to me, Rory, I was in charge of the National Parks. I want you to cut the budget of the National Parks by 20%. So I said, uh, Secretary of State, uh, you know, I think it's going to be very damaging, this and the other. So she said, OK, Rory, for you, 5%. So I said, uh, Secretary of State, if you're just going to cut by 5%, better we don't cut them at all. For you, Rory, we're not going to cut them at all. It was really like yeah. that. Yeah. And I just thought, well, goodness, you know, these kind of ideas are kind of flying out. Then they're being retracted. Then I had Pretty Patel as yes. my boss. Then I had Boris Johnson as my boss. So as you say, quite a run. You must have done some terrible things in a previous life. <laughs> well, tell me a bit about Pretty Patel, because, you know, she might be on the back benches now, but her hand was very much on the tiller for, for a, a number of years. Yeah, so I was in the Department for International Development with her. And again, it's very surprising the way ministers are given jobs. I got the distinct impression that Liz Truss didn't have much interest in the environmental rural affairs, mm. and she was put in charge of that. Pretty Patel was on the record saying that she wanted to abolish the Department for International Development and cut the spend, and she was made put in charge of the Secretary of State. And and I remember, you know, Liz Truss saying to me that the, the the stupidest job she could think of, basically in government, was being Foreign Secretary. She could see no point in foreign affairs, and sure enough, she eventually ended up as the Foreign Secretary. Yes. What's the central thesis of the book then? Is it just a, 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 a kind of um, a, a cornucopia of wonderment at, at how bad things have become? And with the and this is why any possible path back to the parliamentary politics has been immolated beyond any uh, 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 re redemption. You, you really do keep the receipts. You go after people individually, and that comes from a not not an, a personal animus, but I think a personal sense of profound disappointment. Yeah, and there were people I admired a lot. So David Gork, for yes. example, is a real hero in the book. And I thought he was yes. exceptional, partly because he's got very little ego. He's very, very good at his job. Um, is, there, is there a uniting theme, Rory, for the people who, who, who were on the receiving end of your um, criticism? Is there, is there something they yeah, have in common? I think the uniting theme is what I would call a kind of new right populism. Right. They're people who prioritise campaigning over governing who prioritise slogans over complicated ideas and who find it very difficult when they're around the cabinet table to take off the mask that they put on to win elections. So I guess the theme of the book is firstly to describe how bad it is, hopefully occasionally in a humorous way, but really draw people into the reality of it. It would be like, um, uh, you know, you, you, you're about to interview Mick Herron. And mm. I think uh, one of the things somebody said about him is that what he did is he took the kind of James Bond ideas of intelligence and then brought it down to a kind of shabby building called Slough House on the outskirts of London. I'm trying to do the same. I'm trying to get away from the way that um, people often present politicians as kind of dramatic heroes and villains and trying to describe the sheer kind of bureaucracy, mm. the mess the nonsense, the waste of time, in order, and this is, I think, the main thing, to change it. In order, I hope, to describe the problem so we can then explain what a better system could look like. I, 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 you, there's a Hogwarts effect as well, isn't there? I think politicians believe the hype that you've just described. Uh, whenever I visit the Commons, which is deliberately not very often, it, it, I am struck by how hard it must be for somebody. Even these, particularly perhaps the new Red Wall intake that came in in 2019, who would have been... I remember the first time I saw Cambridge College, for example, and, and I thought I'd gone back in time. You, it must add to that sense of, I think it's been described as a complete absence of imposter syndrome. <laughs> yeah, it's, well, it's amazing. I mean, the architecture yes. is like something out of Alice in Wonderland, and you feel that you've gone through the looking glass. You're, you've fallen down a hole, and there are all these strange people in strange uniforms. Nothing's written down. The whole thing's unwritten. You know, I found in my first few weeks mm. I'd sit on a seat in the House of Commons, having been told I could sit anywhere I wanted, at which point the guy next to me, 
um, starts swearing at me because he wants to keep it for some woman that he wants sitting next to him. I mean, the whole thing is a very... You don't name him. I don't name him, no. no. But, but, but there are, I mean, vignettes and moments like that. It's, it's a sort of personal inadequacy that feeds into an institutional unfitness for purpose, I think. And I, th and I think it's partly that... It's partly the structure and the system. I think what it does, and I hope I criticise myself as much as I criticise other people. I mean, mm. I felt that I was becoming a worse person. I was becoming stupider. I was becoming more insecure. Because the way that it all works, the kind of credible sort of ambition and the little sort of hints that number 10 gives you about promotion turns everyone into a child. It yeah. takes dignified people and makes them um, less than what they were before they entered. Have you read um, Enemies of Promise? I imagine I, you uh, have. Yeah, 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 I have. That, yeah, that yeah. theory of permanent adolescence that Cyril Connolly yeah. had is very close to what you've just described, and it's hard to think of anyone who embodies it more than Boris Johnson. 100%. I think the strange thing about him is that we normally have an idea that when we're children, we have sort of magical view of the world. When we're adolescents or in our 20s, we have kind of heroic view of the world. And then as we mature, we get a sense that we're going to die, we have families ourselves, we hit limits, and we begin to develop a more realistic sense of ourselves. But Boris Johnson, and I'd argue some other politicians, mm. never quite seem to do it. It's part of the secret of their resilience, that then that they're able to keep this crazy fiction, fantasy world going in their head yes. long beyond anyone else. Yes, beautifully put. Is there any sense of vindication at all? Because you were one of the early alarms with regard to Johnson. Um, is there any sense of vindication? I mean, I, admittedly, what you've just described about keeping the fantasy alive in their head, it's not dead yet. Uh, the, the Daily Mail will still portray him as more sinned against than sinning. In his own mind, he clearly thinks that he has been unfairly treated or the victim of a witch hunt. The, the, the observable, objective reality for, for people plugged into that world, including still former colleagues of yours like Nadine Doris, they still believe this to be true. But for those of us who know that it isn't, for those of us who are conscious of, of just how disastrous the last few years have been, do, do you ever feel vindicated or do you just feel saddened? I feel very sad because I obviously ran against him for the leadership and I didn't manage to beat him. I didn't manage to stop him becoming prime minister. I mean, I think one of the lessons maybe is that we need to decentralise much more radically. We mustn't allow people like this to to have that much power. That's why I think cities like Manchester, Birmingham should have much more power devolved to them. I think they'll do more sensible economic policy. It's much less tribal and party. And I think we need to change our electoral system to bring fresh new parties in. So no, not, not exactly a small mission. Are you, are you going to play any role in it or, or are you now yeah, a man I'd of love, letters? I'd, I'd love to fight for that. I'd love to, to fight for big constitutional structural change. I, I don't think I'm feeling like going back in the House of Commons. You point out given that my book has basically blown up the House of Commons. They're not likely to be welcomed back anytime soon either. <laughs> A metaphorical Guy Fawkes. Rory Stewart, thank you. Politics thank you on the much. Edge is, is published on the 14th of September. You can certainly order it already, and it's, it's we're in that little pre-publication period where you'll probably find it in some bookshops on the tables in the front already. But, but it is, as I say, published um, on the 14th of September by, by Vintage. The time now is 12.47. James O'Brien on LBC. <laughs> James O'Brien on LBC. 12.50 is the time. It's a bit booktastic, this uh, this part of the programme today. A lot of love coming in for Rory Stewart and imminently, I'm sure, a lot of love coming in for my next guest, Mick Heron, the number one Sunday Times best-selling author of, um, of the Slough House thrillers, of course, but also... Um, a plethora of, of standalone novels and another series, the, 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 the Zoe Bohm series as well. Should probably reveal that we were I was I was interviewing you last night at a, at a book event at, at, at Dulwich College so I, I don't know which of which were your favorite questions if you well, and I'll ask them again <laughs> oh, the, the ones the audience asked for great James <laughs> well you say that the first question from the audience said I haven't read any of Mick Heron's books but I have read one of James's so I, th I thought he was brilliant I, <laughs> I converted him I think. <laughs> he was did, he really did nice actually evening. I saw him buying them afterwards <laughs> he was he was on his way home so the the, the the new book The Secret Hours we should probably begin with a word for for the wise for people who are already familiar with your oeuvre. What can they expect from this one? Well, it is a standalone novel, but it's set in the same universe as the Slough House books. So long-term readers will recognise um, certain aspects, certain characters indeed, although they might not be going under the same names as they do in the Slough House series. 
well, it being an espionage novel, that's par for the course, really. It's all about the cover. It's all about the cover. And as ever, and just I'm sure you heard some of my conversation with Rory Stewart a moment ago, who one reviewer has actually compared, one reviewer of his book has, has compared to one of the protagonists in, in your books, the, the, the sort of... Um, how would you describe River Cartwright, really? It's a sort of very, very idealistic... Uh, hero Manke. I hero think. I Manke. Mean, he would, he yes. would really love to be James Bond, but he isn't. That's it, yes. Uh, that, that, that is what I think someone, Tom Holland, who knows uh, Rory Stewart quite well, has, has, has drawn a parallel between the two. But you, um, I, I, I'm sort of looking at the praise received for The Secret Hours already, and names like Martin Cruz Smith, Michael Connolly, Lee Child. We, we talked a bit last night about the the, the 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 slow journey to the sort of status that you have now and the and the and the, and the dead ends perhaps that, that you went up to what's it like Mick to see the sort of to see yourself alongside the, the, the biggest names in the world world of popular fiction and and enjoying their their admiration well you you touched on imposter syndrome just yes, now with, yes. with Rory. that certainly does strike um, quite quite severely when uh, I'm confronted by names like that um, Lee and, and Michael Connolly I have met on different occasions. Michael Connolly and I have been on the same quiz team, so that was um, you know, quite, quite something. But Martin Cruz Smith in particular, um, he is to me one of the the greatest living thriller writer. He wrote Gorky Park, which for me is the high yeah, watermark of thriller yeah, fiction. Yeah. So to have his um, endorsement on the book is is beyond belief as far as I'm concerned. I'm absolutely thrilled by it. I love it. Um, I, I mean, the questions that you get asked all the time, like where your ideas come from and, and uh, what you're going to do next, notwithstanding. When you create a character like Jackson Lamb, the, 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 the sort of central character at the Slough House series, and, and he assumes uh, a, a life of his own, what, what's it like when you sort of, I mean, the pressure you're under to produce another one of those, while as a writer, you will sometimes want to flex different muscles? Uh, that's true. I'm not really feeling the pressure. I have to say at the moment, because I'm as um, invested in in, uh, in Lamb as as the uh, as my readers are at the moment. I haven't, by any means, grown tired of him, and I want to keep um, uh, seeing what he does next. The pressure, other pressures, I, I don't know. I mean, they they are there, obviously, in a way that they weren't ten years ago for me. But they all disappear when I when I'm actually doing the work. It's all that has never changed. It's always just you know. You're sitting in the zone down and you're in, away. In the zone and like, either being away or not being away, you know. The problems yes. are all to do with actually creating the work in the moment. They're nothing to do with expectation. Is, is, has there been any way, I mean, I know publishers watch these things very closely, of, of seeing what the TV series now starring Gary Oldman has done to the book sales? It presumably you've brought in a whole new audience with the... I'm sure there are figures available, but what I'm noticing is that when I do public events like last night, there will be a, a significant number of people there when they're getting the book signed afterwards, saying, I came to your books through the TV yeah. show. And uh, that, that happens every single time. What was I? I was reading something the other day. It was um, Andrew Lloyd Webber complaining about Cats. So and, uh, the film of Cats. So Andrew Lloyd Webber uh, got a puppy and he wanted to take it to America with him. And he said, it's a psychological support dog. Can, can, and they said, you need to provide us with proof of this. And he said, have you seen what they did? <laughs> Have you seen what they did to cats? And he got the letter back saying, that's fine, you can bring the dog. You're one of those writers who, I, I don't know whether through luck or judgment, has ended up absolutely delighted with the on-screen representation of your characters. Um, luck, most. I mean, my luck and, and the good judgment of, um, of the, many of the people involved in producing it. Uh, they've really, I think I said last night, it's not just that they've gone the extra mile. They've gone a whole other marathon to, to preserve what they wanted in the books to appear on the screen. When you see Slough House on the TV screen, the the exterior of it, that's actually the building that I walked past every day on my way to Sensation. work. You know, it's, it's the real place. So that was, you know, in a sense, unnecessary. Nobody would have noticed other than me, really. Yes. Yes. But they, they did that, and they've done so much else to, to make that happen. The, uh, and presumably there were sort of stages of, of, of delight in the, um, in the process of, of the of the. The filming, and first of all, you you're told that the rights have been bought, and then, then, which is very rarely happens, it actually goes into production. It is, and, and before that, you you discovered that Gary Oldman was going to play, perhaps your most famous creation. Uh, Gary, you know, what was that moment like? Uh, <laughs> one I remember very well. I bet you. Do. I mean, it's it's a long process. It was more than eight years from the first meeting that I had about it to um, the the show being uh, streamed on on Apple TV. 
And I remember talking to Will Smith, who was, came on board very, very quickly within the first few months of this all happening, and him saying to me, this will all happen very, very slowly until it starts happening really quickly. Yeah. And um, Gary Oldman coming on board was the turning point as far as the, the, um, the speed went. Because yeah. that focus is everybody knows that we're cooking with gas now. Absolutely. As it were. Yes, everybody wanted to be part of it once, uh, once Gary had signed uh, up. And, and uh, there's more to come. I know we've had Series 2. Series 3 will show before the end of the year. Series 4 will show next year. And, and um, as we mentioned, The Secret Hours is out now. You, 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 when you finish a book, I know that's it for you. You, you, you kind of um, are more interested in what you're going to be doing next than in... I rarely take a long break between books. So you're um, already hard at work. I myself quite... Have you nearly finished the next one? <laughs> no, I'm on page five, I think. <laughs> okay, yes. And is that part of the series or is that a standalone one? This will be the next book in the series. It will be. Well, hurry up, will you? Seriously, <laughs> I've got a holiday book. It's going to be, it's going to be ages. Um, Mick Heron, always a pleasure to see you. Thank, thank you for, for, for your time today. The Secret Hours, I think like Rory's book, it's out on the 14th That's right, of yes. September, which again means you can pre-order it now or, or pop into central sort of urban bookstores, city bookstores have probably got a few copies knocking around already. Do you still get a thrill when you see it in, 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 in physical form in a window and on a table? Oh, I, I do, this one particularly, because it's, uh, it's a really good-looking book, I think. It is a really good-looking book, yes. Thank you very much, Mick Thank you, James. I, I was going to do a clumsy segue then to a really good-looking radio... No. We do it, I don't okay. mind. Well, from God, a really good looking a book event, from a, come to, on. To a really good-looking radio presenter. If you yeah. missed any of today's show... It's all lies. Uh, you can listen back on Catch Up on Global Player, Rewind live radio or enjoy the whole show podcast all lbc's shows are there as well as the world's biggest podcasts rewind live radio on global player download it for free from your app store or head to globalplayer.com tom swarbrick with you at four and now it's sheila fogarty thanks james o'brien on lbc